you need to do the intro and then introduce yourself and whatever like that uh you can handle the intro since it's on your channel i'll just yeah. fill in okay, where cool. i need to cool oh my god i got so many tabs open shit okay Close this. Uh, okay. All right. We are live. Finally, man. It's so damn late. Yeah. A little late there. Let's give it a second to. Uh, YouTube sometimes takes a second to get it's started. Bad. Yeah. Three hours later. Overstating it so much. Oh, oh God, I guess I should have channel muted. Yeah, I've got to do that too. <laughs> there we go. Let's give it one minute, 8.05 or 7.05, I guess, then we can start. Imagine unironically being British. Hmm. So we should just talk about Big Brother for the next minute before we start, right? Well, I didn't watch the episode yet, so we can't. Otherwise, can, we could. But you, you'll be spoiled. Did they send somebody home, or no. are they doing that tonight? I think that's happening tonight. How's the uh, How's the oldest person looking? Likely target. Uh, you'd think so, but he doesn't seem to be on anyone's radar. Huh. We'll see. All right, I think we've got the whole crew here. Um, that's weird. It says only fifteen watching, but we had like fifty. It's 141 watching, as far okay. as I can see right now. So okay, a lot of bras. I think we've got 30 seconds left. Anything you want to say before we officially start recording, Corey? I've officially started recording already. I'm going to edit this part out, but that ship has well, sailed. Okay. Well, anything before we cross the, the threshold the that can never be crossed? Uh, no. Okay. I've so yes. Everyone in the chat, this is live. Um, let's get started. <clears throat> Hello, guys. This is Eckhart Slaughter, joined by my good friend, Corey. We are... All... Let me start again. <laughs> uh. Hey, guys. This is Eckhart Slaughter, joined by my friend, Corey. We are doing episode three of Tap Calf Transmissions, the still pretty brand new podcast, which will be talking about Star Wars Legends books. This, uh, this intro is a little less clean than last week's, but that's what happens when you do it on my channel. Corey, do you want to uh, give a brief introduction for those of you, for those in the chat who don't know you yet? Uh, hello, everyone. I am Corey. I also do Star Wars lore YouTube stuff and Star Wars gaming stuff on my own channel. So uh, we're here to talk about Wedge's Gamble, which the publisher actually just emailed us right before. It's actually been renamed to Wedge's Surprise Mechanics. So we're going to be <laughs> talking about that tonight. Wow, that is a that spicy. is a very yeah, that's a spicy joke and well timed. I've been waiting two it. hours to say it. So now I've got to make sure I upload this on the Podbean properly, or else the joke will be really dated. I can't get lazy <laughs> with it. Speaking uh, but, of, for those of you who would prefer just to listen to this, um, because we are still trying to figure out the mechanics of how this podcast will work, it will be live on YouTube. One week we'll do my channel, um, and then two weeks later for the next episode, it will go on Corey's channel. Um, at least live, then you can go between them and watch whatever VOD you'd like. But we also will have it available on Spotify. We have it on iTunes now and also Podbean. Links to all of that down in the description. Yep. If you're watching this on my channel, you can see links to Eckhart's channels in the description. If you're watching it on Eckhart's Lanterns, Eckhart's Lanterns, <laughs> Eckhart's yeah, channels, there's links to mine in the description as well. I've also got the main channels for each of us on the layout for the stream here. So you can see links to either channel always because shameless self-promotion is what the internet's all about. Yep. Uh, so should we, let's get right into it because one th a bit of feedback we did get from last episode is we kind of meandered a bit. We got on one topic and they were like really random topics too. Um, and we kind of stayed on there for like 20 minutes. So this time we are going to try to be a bit more organized. Corey was nice enough to write us out a little schedule. Uh, or not a schedule, but a, I guess key points to to to, uh, to tackle. And we will still get a little off topic, but we're trying to figure out a format that really works. So yeah, make the first sure... Time... Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, the first time it was a bit too, like, point by point. 
Uh, yeah. And then the second time we got a little bit too far away from that. So we're trying to find where the happy medium for that is. So keep the feedback coming. We'll keep doing our best to adjust for whatever works. Yep. And I guess one last thing to mention before we get into it is we do now have an email address. So if you want to, like, we encourage you guys to read along with us. The schedule and the order we're doing things in is pretty obvious. We're going to, you know, keep doing X-Wing and then we'll move to whatever works chronologically. So next week, for example, will be Crytos Trap. Um, so if two you want to read and, oh, sorry, yeah, two weeks from now, we cried Oz Trap. So if you guys want to read and, um, share your thoughts, we'll probably try to bring them up during the video as much as we can. Yep. And we'll also take, uh, questions from the chat towards the end of the video as well, or yep, towards the end true. of the stream. Yep. But I guess, okay, so, uh, that brings us yeah. into Wedge's Gamble. Wedge's Surprise. Right. Mechanic. Sorry. I... Right. Or Wedge's Gambit, as the chat was accidentally... I think a few people thought it was genuinely called Wedge's Gambit and that like, we were stupid for getting it wrong. Well, we have a picture of the, uh, of the book cover right there, too. So we're, yeah. we're good. Yeah. So I guess one thing that we were both kind of surprised from, or surprised about, like, I don't want to speak for you, but I know, for me personally, I read these books after they all came out. Um... So I didn't realize, and I thought that the X-Wing series like out of universe came out pretty much right after Thrawn. I didn't realize by this point, they were all the way up to Black Fleet Crisis, which is what, 13 years into the, uh, or I guess 13 years after Yavin, I think, or 14. Like I always had the image of them coming out in the 90s, which is correct, but I always thought like early 90s for Rogue Squadron, and then it was really setting up everything, and Mm. then you kind of went chronologically through after that, but... Like you're yeah. saying, you had pretty much the whole era set up. Corellian Trilogy and Black Fleet Crisis are some of the last things that happened before the Yuuzhan Vong War, and yep. they were coming out at the same time, or even slightly before. Right. Yeah, for me, it was it was more with Duel, because I was like, okay, so did Jedi Academy Trilogy come after this? Because Morth Duel is like obviously a pretty main character in at least parts of that series. Um, but no, he that was way before this, and it's just interesting because this the whole X-Wing series does feel kind of foundational to Star Wars Legends. Like, but yeah, interesting thing that I guess I never thought about. Yeah, we usually start off by talking a little bit about the kind of broader context the book was in and, and out of universe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but since we talked about a lot of that when we started Rogue Squadron mm-hmm. uh, or started X-Wing with Rogue Squadron last time, I don't know if we really will go too much yeah. more into that. Uh, yeah. Michael Stackpole is the author of this book. We talked last time about Mm -hmm. the other stuff he's written, which is the early parts of the X-Wing series. Uh, He's written the next two we're going to be talking about, which is Kratos Trap and Mm. Back to War. He also wrote Isard's Revenge for the X-Wing books. And then you have the Dark Tide books in the Yuuzhan Vong era. And also Mm -hmm. I, Jedi, which is another book about Corrin that we are going to be talking about later. But anything else you want to add for that information? No, just that. Why nothing in new canon yet? I wonder. Is is he still contracted with Phantom? I'm not sure because I know he's like had a well, isn't Bantam part of um whatever company is now doing Star Wars? Isn't Bantam technically part of whatever company owns Del Rey? I I'm think? not sure. I, I I'm assuming whatever he is or isn't doing would have more to do with specifics of his current contracts than anything, but Yeah, well he said like uh he's he's had a willingness to and i don't want to get too off topic but he's he's had a has a willingness to write star wars again he says he enjoys it um there's like a lot of rumors about how lucasfilm uh treats their writers and stuff but like he's had a willingness to come back just like of course timothy zahn came back i don't know alphabet squadron would have been something like that would have been a good option but i guess it was for not yeah uh should well, we, we move got into... back i'm sure at some point if they're yeah um, okay, so let's talk about, I guess the best the best place to jump in would be like the in-universe context. And obviously Coruscant is the planet in Star Wars. It's the seat of the Empire and hopefully after the end of this story, the seat of the New Republic. So Corey, why would you say that capturing Coruscant is or isn't the right move for the New Republic at this point? Well, for any, so after the Empire fell apart, there's so many different disparate factions, and whoever can get Coruscant has legitimacy in the galaxy's eyes. It's going to be very hard to hold, which is what a lot of the book is about. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So all their plans for how to get Coruscant really have to take into account how can you get and then hold Coruscant. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were talking a little bit before the show about, well, is it really a good idea for uh, for Isar to do her plan in this book on Coruscant, which is to, we'll get into it, but to give up Coruscant. And that was a large part of it, is that she kind of realizes that the New Republic is going to come, or Warlord Zinge is going to come, and someone is going to take over. So Coruscant is really the, the crux of everything. Right. And yeah, it's like the same thing. We mentioned this a little bit with Borlias. Like the key is taking the planet, but making sure that the defensive structures are still in place. If you destroy the shield generator or if you kill half the populace and they are going to rise up against you, then it was all for naught. And there's one part where Akbar talks about like, the strategic options to take the planet, there's a blockade, which was seen as not feasible because basically the entire rebel fleet would have had to be around the planet uh, to cut supplies off. Not only are you really killing the people in the Undercity before anybody else, but then you know, you've know you got Zinj and the other warlords kind of uh, romping about now undefended territory, taking planets back, doing whatever. Um, so it's an interesting mechanic, and we see it with Thrawn too. Yeah, the, one of the things the book actually touches on a little bit is just how self-reliant Coruscant isn't when they're talking about whether they can mm -hmm. blockade it. So even basic resources get shipped in. Uh, it, obviously, not much not much farming you could do. You, there's probably some yeah. technology that allows some food production. Yeah. And waste management must be just absolutely... I think they're just thrown into a hole somewhere. <laughs> the Maw? <laughs> yeah. They tell you that the Maw was built to keep Avaloth in. Really... It was just, of Coruscant's waste. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they've got the poles. Like, and it's interesting because Legends, there are a few times where they mention like Coruscant having um, like snowy poles. I think, doesn't Han go skiing in the Jedi Academy yeah, they trilogy? Take a, they take a vacation up there a couple times. I think yeah. it, is it in the Thrawn trilogy where it comes up too? I don't remember. I don't but, remember, but they definitely yeah. do... And there's a big Vacation there's a big the ocean pole. too. Yeah. Um, but none of this is like like even just the basic elements of how Coruscant is like I guess talked about is changed pretty wildly between books. Like when I read this, I imagine Coruscant as being basically a city with really tall buildings and there is an undercity, but not to the degree we get later where it's like especially as like Legends was near its end, Coruscant is almost like an ocean. You've got the kind of basic level that the skyscrapers are built upon but then you've got a thousand levels below that and like no one ever goes to the bottom and yeah, this like, it's kind of like coruscant is a bit more kind of reasonably sized yeah and everyone would picture kind of the coruscant we got in the prequel trilogy but mm -hmm. coruscant was one of the things that was brought in from developments of the expanded universe for the past few decades that george lucas then brought in so the the whole like ecumenopolis situation that we kind of think of now wouldn't have really existed this was it being developed before mm -hmm. those ideas were transferred into the movie so one of the things i was trying to picture with all that is just how what we've seen from the movies kind of translates to or how much it matches up with uh what comes up here right like yeah i mean that's wild speeder chases being something mm -hmm. that features in both yeah i mean the, the way the jedi it's not so bad with the original trilogy stuff like Especially with space combat is closer, I think, in the X-Wing series to the original trilogy than we see later on, because like ships are fighting at extremely close distances. Um, you know, it's it's I said this last episode, it's basically jet planes in space um, where other expanded universe stuff like if you read, say, Legacy of the Force, the capital ships are you know firing at each other from maybe a few hundred kilometers away. The uh, the starfighters are doing the same. Well, not quite the same, but, you know, they're on a similar scale. Um, so this matches that pretty closely where it diverges a little bit more is how they treat Jedi and the Clone Wars, although they actually do a pretty good job in this book of not like putting their foot in their mouth too much. They kind of do that later a bit when we get to Jedi Academy, but this one wasn't too bad, I thought. Yeah, it jumps ahead a little bit to bring this up now, but there was one particular line where it does kind of clash with what we know from episode three, where it. The line was, after the resolution of the Clone Wars, the Jedi began to move towards an open grab for power. So right. there wasn't quite the same idea that uh, the Clone Wars ended with Order 66 or something similar 
It was instead Clone Wars ended, Jedi were trying to take power, or the right. narrative was that the Jedi were trying to take power, and then yeah. Palpatine cracked down on them. Whereas in uh, as it later developed, it was all kind of one big event. Yeah, another thing too is Palpatine. They were, in, and this goes back to the novelization for um, Episode Four. They refer to him just as a senator, so I don't think it was clear. Like he seemed to be one of many senators, maybe the most corrupt, and um, and because yeah, in this book it says Senator Palpatine at the time, basically, um, before he declared the empire. So I don't know if he was, if that was just if he was supposed to be, you know, the chief of state or the head of state, whatever they would have made the term to be, or if that was kind of a idea that came with the, with the um, the the prequel trilogy. Yeah, like Palpatine as Darth Sidious hadn't really. Like, I'm pretty sure that wouldn't have really come up because that um, was like they they definitely had him as obviously a, a force user. But I, the yeah. idea of the Sith was something that they kind of had to be a bit more vague on until right. George Lucas did the stuff in the prequel trilogy. Like even in Dark right. Empire, it hints yeah, at some yeah. stuff and that. But it, it they end up a lot like what they had to do with the Clone Wars mentions, be very vague about it. Right. Well, yeah, and it, like. Everyone knows the story where Timothy Zahn wanted the Nogri to be the Sith, right? They didn't have a yeah. whole lot of idea of what was going on. But yeah, because the original idea for Palpatine 2 back in the novelization was that Palpatine was the Emperor. The Emperor himself wasn't Force sensitive, but was kind of being manipulated by like some sort of dark sider. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously that changed and they were kind of put into one individual. But you're right, the idea of like what a Sith actually was definitely hadn't you know, fully came out at this point. They say Sith occasionally, um, like especially like Sith spit or Sith spawn. But uh, mostly when you deal with some, some an evil force user, they call them Dark Jedi. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a mention here of uh, Zizer's grab for power was in from the start, but it was the Black Sun organization that allowed him to contemplate opposing the Dark Lord of the Sith. Where, mm -hmm. because of just the context of that, it's not entirely clear if it was talking about uh, Vader with that or Palpatine. Right. right. But that's interesting. Uh, I guess the we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves there. Yeah. So as we have been kind of discussing, the main plot of the book is the capture of Coruscant and mm -hmm. exactly how the New Republic should go about that. So a lot of the opening phase of the book are. Uh, some meetings with the Provisional Council, including uh, some other military figures like uh, Wedge is there and mm -hmm. uh, General Som. I think it was Som there. I don't think I don't he's think there so. for this one. No. So he's been a big he's character in the last book, but he was not. Yeah. He kind of falls to the wayside here. Uh, yeah, it's like Mon Mothma, um, a few of the like admirals, and then yeah, I, I don't remember what. Um, yeah, I can't remember exactly who was there, but what did you? What do you think of like the the bit of politics that early on, or like how how do you think they handled it? I guess. I think a lot of it was handled relatively okay, but it was still working off of relationships that we already knew where they went. Because mm -hmm. the big political kerfuffles in this period are kind of between. Akbar and Borsphalia, who yeah, definitely. Uh, hasn't really come up so far in the podcast because he wasn't a major character uh, that's super involved with anything we've been talking about so far. Like, he yeah, I think he gets to mention maybe but, intrusive Bakura, is it? Uh, he he's definitely mentioned a, a couple times, but he's not really doing it. You don't learn too much about him. But by this point, uh, the Thrawn trilogy, as we were saying, has already come out. Uh, some of the later stuff has already come out and he's kind of been set up as this rival for Akbar. Mm -hmm. uh, they do bring it up as Laren Crefay, the uh, the incompetent Bothan from the last episode or the last book, Rogue Squadron, who yeah. kind of failed at Orleus, was kind of the Bothan's last military hope. So yeah, they, they like, yeah, and he's right. And then he he like because we should give a bit of context for Bothans because they are like a really big part moving forward. Um, basically, Bothans are like all about securing power and like political scheming and stuff is completely normal to them. So whenever Borsk talks, he's always got some sort of secondary motivation or he's always trying to do something. Yes, ultimately, he does want the New Republic to be successful, 
but he wants to get credit and he wants to grab power. Yeah, um, he, he kind of just doesn't. We don't get anything from his perspective yet, but no. you can see there's a couple conversations between him and Akbar where it's like pretty clear that he doesn't realize that Akbar isn't operating the same way he is, so he yeah. kind of just expects that Mon Mothma, Leia, Akbar, and even Wedge are kind of playing the same political game he is, mm -hmm. where that's just part and parcel of running the government or setting up the New Republic. Right. They talk about, he ta uh, I think Akbar or Leia, when talking with Wedge, she talks about like how Akbar set the meeting up to be as favorable as possible to him. Like he makes it so the environment they're in is really comfortable to all of uh, his allies, but uncomfortable to all of Akbar's allies. And you actually sent me a kind of funny meme you made about that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the, it's something that comes up a few times in the book where Celestians, uh, I guess. Maybe it hadn't, I'm going to just say, maybe it hadn't been established yet that Sullust was volcanic, and they're on this, uh, it, it may have been, I might just be giving him too much credit, but the, there's always mentions of Celestians liking the cold, or just this grassland, plains, planet, Nakivzor being, uh, being too warm for the Celestians. <laughs> it's like a warm breeze. <laughs> There's like I think there's at least two mentions, maybe three. Yeah, there, there of are like air conditioning being set up for Celestians. Like, no, dude, they live on a lava planet. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, there are a few little kind of logical inconsistencies, just like that. The one that I kind of noticed was with Zinge when Leia's talking about Zinge. Uh, and I guess after I mentioned this, maybe we should go deeper into him because he's. I like how they use him in this book, but. Mm -hmm. Zinj is I, I would say he's the war, he's the warlord at this point and probably the most powerful warlord ever unless you count like Thrawn I guess or if you count the Emperor um, I guess Dala when she unifies them all is maybe a little bit more powerful but Zinj is like big daddy like he's like throwing his weight around his cons his considerable weight around <laughs> he's definitely <laughs> and, uh, the big bad but like I, you, I think the Penistar element probably is the most yeah. powerful, but they're not active, which is convenient because no early books bring them up. It's almost as if they were invented afterwards. Totally for the uh, essential guide to warfare. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, she talks about how Zinj was like kind of incompetent. Well, not incompetent, but she basically suggests that he grabbed a lot of power after the after the death of the emperor. Like he took because he he had a super star destroyer. Um, I don't know if it the, is, is. Does he call it the Iron Fist after, after Endor? Because it's called the Brawl first, right? And then he renames it. Yeah, I'm yeah, not sure so, exactly when, but yeah. So basically, but later lore, I guess, kind of lays out that he was actually one of the most powerful individuals, like in the Empire's heyday, because he has. Is it the Quelly Oversector? I think he has control yeah. of, which is like a big, big portion of the galaxy. He's got fleets under his command. I think even like the. The Crimson Command is technically his. Originally, it was supposed to be his, but uh, the Teradoc brothers took it right after right. Endor. It, it gets kind of messy with how all that gets divided because technically, a lot of sources had Oversector Outer, which is what Kane controlled, right. being the entire Outer Rim, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So he had everything up at like Bastion, which is northwest, down mm -hmm. to Arido Authority territory, which mm -hmm. is south central. And everything in the rim was his, but then you have Zinj taking a lot of the northeast, yeah. and then Penistar ends up in the northwest. Uh, Aradoc just under Zinj, but a lot of that was stuff that was established later. Yeah, like it's it's weird because Zinj is kind of simultaneously described as being really expansionist, like especially when compared to the Pentastar alignment. But he also would have had this really large territory, and he would have had like part of the reason he is so powerful is because. When the emperor fell, he had all of this, all of these assets under his command already. Um, yeah, and he's also kind of uh, a person for whom the title of warlord was a title yeah. beforehand as well, uh, exactly. where everyone else just kind of took the title for him and right. had some sort of, or even if it wasn't like a, a formal military rank, it was at least a ceremonial thing he had. Didn't Thrawn get that title too? Uh, Thrawn, I think he, if he technically got it it would have been later but mm -hmm. it it's another thing that's kind of inconsistent right um so yeah i guess to set up the 
the context for what's going on here because I, I wouldn't say Zinge is as powerful as the New Republic, but like he's really throwing his weight around right now. And yeah, like he's a he's a thick boy too. Especially when he's got that super star destroyer. And like Leia kind of talks about how him having a super star destroyer is like an ego thing. I guess we get the same thing kind of with um with I side later on. But um but yeah, so he's there's basically the the Empire, like the and it, it's hard to just call one faction the Empire because you know, they're all sort of came from the Empire, but Isard's Empire, I guess, has a sort of legitimacy because you can trace her, I guess, command to like the actual ruling council and whatnot. So she's kind of seen as, I guess, one of the main Imperial factions at this point. Then, of course, there's the New Republic, and they, by this point, have a lot of planets, and there's a lot of neutral planets. Then there's Zinj, and then there's a lot of other warlords as well. Yeah, so Thrawn, but. <laughs> after Palpatine dies, Saint Pestage was kind of set up as his, uh, the guy who was in charge until a proper successor could be found. And a lot of it does come back to these were the people that were in charge of Coruscant. So yeah. even a lot of the warlords that broke off, uh, aside from Zinj, were still paying some kind of lip service to Imperial Center. So yeah. whoever was ruling from Coruscant. Uh, so you had warlords like Harsk and uh, even the Teradox who were. Uh, fleshed out a lot more later but they would still say technically we're loyal to like mm -hmm. technically we're loyal to the empire uh and would listen as long as uh someone was ruling from coruscant and that's another reason why coruscant was so important as soon as you do that it kind of breaks everyone up and there's no clear power right. structure yeah because there's no like thread connecting them yeah like yeah. And this whole, I mean, we'll get to this more, I think, when we get to the Thrawn trilogy and if we do Dark Empire, but this whole era is made complicated by the fact that, like, when Thrawn comes about in his trilogy, he's kind of described as being on his own. Um, but later material, like the Essential Guide to Warfare, talked about, I think it talks about the Pentastar alignment giving him ships and even maybe their Super Star Destroyer before his death. Um, and then we also have the Dark Empire with, um, Palpatine basically whispering to people and telling them to come to the deep core. So it's a, there's like a lot of kind of context here that's built up later by other material, which I don't know. I find it interesting and I think it kind of makes sense because you've got to think of a realistic way for the Empire to lose 25,000 Star Destroyers. Mm -hmm. The point um, that the Battle for Coruscant involves too, even if they are trying to give <laughs> away the planet. Yes. Well, at one point, there were seven victory Star Destroyers. That's when they're true. talking about Coruscant's defenses, there were seven victories. Which are more they're... powerful than Golan 3s, which can also melt by direct sunlight. Which right. you can, super, like, if you have a big enough mirror and you concentrate on something, yeah, you, it'd get, you do some damage. But the, that went a little bit far here. It was like melting a Golan 3. Yeah. So maybe we'll get to that, because there's a lot of interesting stuff in the later battle. Uh, I guess we'll get to that part later. But is there anything else you want to talk about? State of the Galaxy? Just the New Republic is really just kind of plugging away. Yeah, we've um, we covered most of it, but I guess just to reiterate that Coruscant was seen as how you establish legitimacy, and it was a three-horse race. Or they saw it as a three-horse race between New Republic, the Empire proper under Isard, and Zinj, where if Isard kept Coruscant, the New Republic attacked and failed, then Zinj could come in and take it. If Zinj attacked and they like whoever won between in the initial assault would just leave them both vulnerable for the third person to come in. So that really is why it set up so much of the assault around how do we get it in a way that allows us to keep it. Yeah, the main kind of factor is the planetary shields, which I don't know if I quite buy just because I feel like it would be really hard to fully invade a planet like Coruscant. Just because it's so large, you, like, I guess they do kind of get to this like. It doesn't like she hides curtain lore there and other cells there, but I just feel like Coruscant would be a very difficult planet to hold because you can hide entire armies like under the city if you wanted. Yeah, it's kind of ironic that the planet that could save the galaxy from not being governed couldn't govern itself. Hmm. Palpatine meme or something. Yeah. You almost did it. I, yeah. Oh well. Close enough. You know what I was going for. I do. Um, so do you want to talk about Rogue Squadron itself at this point? Because first off, and I, I mentioned last book about how the series has a tendency to in, like 
quietly introduce major plot points. Like I think they do that with um with Noir Event and Lujani. But um in this one, wait, is it Lujani Noir Event is dating? Uh, was, was no, it, Noir Event is dating Rosati. Rosati, right. Um, but it does that in this book too, where it like kind of quietly introduces a piece of information, which is that Broar Jace is supposedly dead. And yeah. Broar Jace in the last book is like Rogue Squadron's, besides for Wedge, Rogue Squadron's best or second best pilot. Yeah, so we open up with main character, quote unquote, killed off off screen. Uh, yeah. Is he actually dead? Who knows? Uh, we know. <laughs> but we do know. The, there's two new squadron members they have after all the casualties of the last few, or of the last book, the last few battles of the last book, uh, where Errol Nunn, who was kind of introduced at the start of Rogue Squadron uh, as one of the candidates for the initial selection. Oh, uh, right. I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, and Wedge even kind of mentions that with, uh, you weren't selected before because it was a you were going to be training people, but you were too good. Uh, and then we have God's gift to Himself, Pash Kraken. <laughs> Such a Mary Sue. <laughs> I was just too good at everything, so I had to leave so I could prove how good I was again. Yeah. So Pash Kraken is the son of Aaron Kraken. I think that's how you say his first name, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Kraken, who. <laughs> He appears in Return of the Jedi, and he's got a long storied career until a well, a fateful death that we'll get to eventually. Um, but his and he's like, I guess right now at this point, he's like the head of New Republic intelligence, and I think he stays the head until he dies, right? Yeah, he's uh, he's busy writing threat dossiers, right? <laughs> we gotta do a whole video just dedicated to Kraken's threat dossiers, oh and it's really oh janky God. art, <laughs> just a video of it burning. Yeah. Um, but uh yeah, so Pash is his son, and basically he's described as like just the perfect guy. He's a real sweet boy. Um, he's got nice hair, but most importantly, he's like a savant when it comes to flying a starfighter. Um he goes undercover into the Empire and he leaves with a bunch of um was it a full squadron of ties, I think? And um, uh, yeah, their... he left with all of his ties and everyone lived because he's so good. Right. And then uh, he's like, yeah, my squad, I was too good. My squad thinks I'm invincible, so I'm not performing to my full potential. I'm getting lazy. I'm going to get someone killed. So he joins Rogue Squadron where he still is like the best pilot besides maybe Corrin. At one point, Corrin's like, no one could have kept up with me besides Pash. Um, and then, because he's like, yeah, I need somewhere where I'll be more grounded. And apparently that's Rogue Squadron. Yeah, he uh, he was flying A-Wings with Kraken's flight group, which is what he had under his command. And uh, Wedge even, Wedge says something like, oh, are you sure we're going to be, we're not going to be too slow for you flying X-Wings? So yeah. he's going to uh, a type of ship he's not as familiar with. And he's just, mm -hmm. I think it's actually, is it Wedge that makes the point of like, no one but maybe Pash would keep up with Corrin? Yeah, this I think is one right. point where it's yeah, not I think you're right. being an ego dick. Because yeah. there's a lot of places where Corrin is Corrin's biggest fan. But yeah. you got to give him credit where credit's due. And that it's, it's not always him praising himself. Yep. I've got to correct myself, by the way, too. I thought Kraken died in the Vong, but apparently he just doesn't. So. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm yeah, not sure if he died or not, but he does kind of fade into obscurity. Yeah, like Maydeen dies with Dark Saber. Yeah, and they talk about uh, is it General Reekin or Do no? They th I think they talk about Dodonna just randomly dying off screen in this one. Yeah, but of course he's not dead either. Yeah, he um, had Dodonna, and I something like that. Dodonna dies in canon though. Like, canon kills Dodonna in like the. Uh... The comics, like before even Empire Strikes Back, hmm. or before Return of the Jedi. I we barely remember. had any ships at Yavin. We had General Dodonna, but he's gone. Yeah. Back at Yavin, we didn't have any admirals. Yep. Um. Oh, that was one other thing that kind of came up. I'm not sure if it was earlier with Akbar, if it was during his one-on-one -on -one meeting later with, uh, with Borsk, but 
Uh, it kind of you get a bit of Akbar's internal monologue where uh, he was thinking he was useful because he brought the ships from Mon Calamari. He served as like Tarkin slave, so he knew mm -hmm. a lot of military doctrine. But uh, it doesn't really paint Akbar as quite the brilliant strategist. Like the reason for his uh, yeah, no, I agree. Isn't necessarily the brilliant strategist thing that would come up in pretty much everything else for him yeah where he was it's still kind of a status a, thing yeah i mean which is weird because i guess stuff like even by jedi academy trilogy like he's you know akbar's got some big nuts on him well but like at this even by the thrawn trilogy three years right. later it's talking about him as being kind of like right but i think he played pretty thrawn. hard by thrawn though well, I always I always felt like in the Thrawn trilogy, Akbar gets outplayed pretty hard. He does, but it, the stuff where he's getting outplayed is more because Borsk is like ripping him up as right. well, where he's not really yeah. free to act on anything. Well, I'd say at the end, like the New Republic fleet gets put into a really bad position because Thrawn, because Akbar misreads like Thrawn's tactics. Yeah. I think, and he's um, he's still doing really good things in Rogue Squad, or like his. Especially, like, it shows him as being really good with interpersonal relationships other than... Yeah, like, definitely. Uh, like, whenever he's diffusing things between Wedge and Psalm, uh, mm -hmm. he, he's pretty... got a pretty good grasp of everything with Orleus, with Coruscant. Mm -hmm. uh, it, usually his shortcomings come from, like, political side of things working against him. In this book, he, on the tactic side, he does pull off... What I read to be basically the uh, Akbar slash, which is mentioned in like some of the. Uh, this is how how I read it anyway. And I've got a problem kind of reading space combat, but what you know at the end when they've got like they're assaulting the the star destroyers, and he basically pushes right through the middle and hits both of them with the the guns on the. Uh, yeah, I think so, the whole one uh, and stuff. That was kind of like an Akbar slash. I think it was really. Monarch was fighting Liberator. It was yeah. Triumph and. Monarch on the Imperial side, Liberator and Emancipator. Which are really weird names for Imperial ships. Yeah, I, I kept thinking, like, oh, are these new? new yeah, me ones? too. No. Triumph kind of makes sense, but Monarch, it, I guess, could Emperor Monarch. Yeah. But either way, two of the yeah. Star Destroyers are kind of uh, broadsiding each other, and then he sends Mon Ramonda and MCADB in front of mm -hmm. the Star Destroyer that was on the Imperial side and was able to mm -hmm. just unload on it while it was fighting the other New Republic one. Yeah a nice little maneuver but he does you're right he does even with he doesn't have a whole lot of political skill but he is kind of aware of what he needs to do to get like his his strategy accepted like he purposefully allows failure to get some wins so that he seems like he wants to negotiate properly um i, I think they mentioned that akbar was never really interested in a blockade um but yeah. that he he kind of wanted to give he wanted to give Borsk the opportunity to shoot it down and to kind of be right on this one. Yeah. Um. So in that way, and you know, honestly, Borsk is really insulting in this book. Like they basically make him like as much of an asshole as they possibly can. That's everything with him up until like five minutes True. before he dies. Yeah, like two minutes. <laughs> um. But yeah, I got, I got like the quote so. At the beginning of the book, Borlias is attacked by... I forget what kind of transport it is. It's like a small bulk freighter, I think, basically. Um, and loaded with TIE fighters. And Corrin is basically only able to figure out what's going on because he uses the Force. And it, it's pretty clear, I think, in this one that he's using the Force a few times. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, he knows that there's something going on. He kind of knows there's something going on with the Reese as well. Um... And then, but for, so there's ties, it's, but he produces all this, you know, the ship has all the right signatures and stuff, but Corrin thinks something's wrong. Um, but however, him and I think it's a couple of Y-Wings that are in his sector of the the planet are able to defeat the the fighters. I think they even um, hit one with an ion cannon. Unfortunately, their transport escapes. Still pretty miraculous that they didn't lose anybody. And then Borsk is like, you guys suck. Like you let the transport get away, and Akbar's just like, "Are you serious?" Yeah, they had two fighters or three fighters. Yeah, that's like, so they had that's six... some of the first combat we see with Zinj sending its feelers out, and there's a few notes of that, like, "Oh, Zinj is just 
sending out these yeah. ships, kind of seeing what people are going to do, too. Yeah. So, um, Akbar says, the freighter fled before the fighter screen was, was eliminated, but even if it had not, engaging it would have been suicidal. And then he says, I thought such missions were Rogue Squadron's speciality or specialty. So, basically, he just, like, he's got no sort of, just no respect, really. And Akbar kind of manages to keep it together, despite the fact yeah. that, <laughs> as Die Ghostfish says, nine quad lasers, Borsk. <laughs> Shouldn't we be killing every enemy frigate with one fighter? What, like, what is this? Yeah. I guess they're thinking, like, oh, if the Millennium Falcon and an X-Wing can kill a Death Star each time, then if you compare the tonnage there, a fighter against a fruit, like, yeah. this should be easy. And then Wedge kind of feels the same as Akbar about politics. He's got another very, um, just a, a really thinking man's quote. <clears throat> I think finding enemy ships and shooting them up is easier than this politics stuff. And he says that to Leia after the meeting. Yeah, there's a, uh, Wedge actually, uh, that kind of position, like Wedge's position with politics, is going to come up a lot in the beginning of Kratos Trap, because mm-hmm. uh, the book ends with uh, Corin, everyone thinking Corin is dead. So the next one opens with uh, a funeral for Corin. So, right, uh, you get a lot more into Wedge's position. It's kind of like the military position mm-hmm. in the New Republic on how uh, the more like the more political elements the Provisional Council are handling things. But you did bring up something uh, with Corrin's force use there that I think is kind of interesting for the whole traitor subplot, mm-hmm. where uh, we're kind of being led to believe, or like elements within the New Republic are thinking that Tycho is willingly or not some kind yeah. of sleeper agent for uh, for the New Republic, and just just the idea of Tyke or of Corrin trusting his gut or not, mm-hmm. where you kind of have a Arisi and Tycho being kind of reflections of each other where Corin has his all of his training telling him to listen to these things about Tycho probably being wrong but not right. being able to fight this kind of gut feeling or instinctual feeling that he looks up to Tycho and he respects Tycho when that's the uh that is the correct path he should be taking he should be following his instincts rather than this rationalization he's trying to force on top of it that he shouldn't trust Tycho mhm but it's like the opposite um, right because he's like because they're, they're in their room and they're about to you know <laughs> do the thing that the jedi can't do and um he's like he's like there's no reason why we can't because we're completely safe you know it's really not going to mess the mission up that much but there's just something like in his gut that yeah. tells him he can't do it and probably also the fact that like she pushes for it a lot and isn't like yeah like there's something going on, and he he knows with her. Well, he doesn't know that there's something going on, but um, yeah, it's just but interesting, he, right? I never thought about them like he's that. got the gut instinct that he shouldn't trust her in trying to rationalize all these reasons why he should be closer to her. Mm-hmm. And I guess I forgot to put your name on uh, on the stream layout. Is something I just noticed. Oh, that's fine. It says it says Justin. Oh, mine doesn't. Oh. So, anyways, keep going. Wow. Um, fix one it thing. In post. <laughs> <laughs> fix it in post we're doing it live and we'll fix it in post um one thing i find interesting just generally and i kind of touched on this earlier is the conversation between um between leia and wedge because obviously the relationship between the two has changed pretty significantly because leia is now working politics and that's like and wedge is forced to as well although to a lesser degree leia is also starting to settle down a little bit with han um and i guess as we learn luke is off on some adventures we never really learn about and he's given leia some instructions on how up i kind of does what he does in canon after return of the jedi oh sorry i lost you for a second there okay uh there we go sorry about that last about 10 seconds of that okay um, I was just saying that it's interesting. The conversation between the two is interesting because Leia and Wedge, to a lesser degree, have sort of been forced to move into politics. Leia is obviously a politician. Wedge has to um, live with the rules politicians are putting upon him where they didn't have to as the rebellion. But what's more, 
we know that Luke, or we learn in this conversation that Luke is sort of doing what he did in canon. Um, he's out on a mystery to find Jedi artifacts and whatever else that we didn't really, we've never really learned about. And he's also given Leia some instructions on how to further her own force abilities. Yeah, I, I kind of, I just love the idea of Luke going around because we, everything we read about his early attempts to rebuild the order, all of his early uh, mm. apprentices, like I'm just thinking of like 10 Dev Sivwara situations that we just never hear about. <laughs> Where he finds these people, they die immediately, and we never. <laughs> oh, Luke! Luke fought a race of snail people on Malastare, <laughs> and <laughs> he found a snail Jedi. But unfortunately, he salted him or something. <laughs> I kept wondering why during the Vong War he kept calling it the New New Jedi Order. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that would have been an interesting story, uh, but we don't really learn much about that, do we? I can't think of him hunting. You know, he visits De like Dagobah again, but we kind of get oh. some stuff with like I think Shadows of Mindor. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. At what he'd it's be in doing that... around that time. Yeah, yeah it's in also hollow drama changes right. to what could have been happening. Right, Shadows of Mindor is weird. I just read part of it for a video I was doing on Chronal, and yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty freaky. But I guess we. Uh... But what do you think about Leia as a Jedi? Like, because she. Or let's just talk briefly, because this is the first time we've thought really about Leia being a Force user, because I don't think it even mentions it at all in Trusa Pakura, other than maybe she might say, oh, I don't feel like like Wedge died, or like Luke died or anything. Yeah. Um, it, she's like the, the slowest burn. The Leia becoming a Jedi subplot has mm -hmm. to be one of the slowest burns in all of Star Wars, where it's by yeah. Legacy of the Force... That's she's she like really... a full-fledged yeah because yeah. because she tries she's, she's sab as apprentice at some point and that's yeah and legacy of the force yeah or maybe late new i can't remember if late new jedi order if she but she does yeah, some training like... but it's not like officially you are part of the order like before then it's hey maybe you can use a lightsaber sometimes and mm -hmm. here's how you lift something don't look right. more and this is going to be offensive to you but... <laughs> don't look well, i can do this on my first try <laughs> isn't this so easy <laughs> wow Corey, <laughs> what's wrong with you um but yeah even on like because i remember in jedi in the jedi academy trilogy when she's dealing with the uh what are they called again the bugs dark nest that's correct yeah uh came from the chat, but yeah oh yeah dark nest right um but yeah when, she, when she's dealing like she kills um baldorian she's kind of a jedi at that point but not like yeah. Really, she, she kills she, a hot. Like, come on. She's always had some level of like involvement, but she's not oh, super yeah. close. It, it's kind of like but, I guess Corin does a similar thing too. Yeah, totally. All even of the like early Kyle Katarn and Kyle yeah. Corin, Kip, even yeah, like Kip. But yeah, by by Legacy of the Force and Fate of the Jedi, she's referring to herself as like Jedi Knight Solo. Yeah, or Jedi Knight Organa Solo, taking orders um, from Jaina. Yeah, well, basically, well, they're both Jedi Knights at the same time, which is, but they, they get invited to all the council meetings for reasons. Well, Jaina makes sense. She's like sort of the Jedi, but Leia is like just some old lady. Yeah. Uh... I don't mind it, though. I think it's kind of interesting that like she was too busy raising, well, not raising children because she was always off doing stuff. Winter but being was too busy raising her children. <laughs> Winter and C-3PO and the no grief. <laughs> It's because they're lucky they can even speak basic. <laughs> they don't just grow up learning no great grunts. Or like Anakin is basically with the nanny droid the entire time. But if, if you're chief of state, it's going to be pretty difficult to find time to learn to be a Jedi. So oh, yeah. I understand totally. No, it takes it makes sense. Long. I mean, the but same thing kind of happened in canon, too. Um, yeah. Like, she's obviously got force abilities. We see, like, in The Last Jedi, and when she feels yeah, Han dying, yeah. like... She can fly. Like, um, I feel like a lot of it, if we were to get more from Leia's perspective, because we actually don't get a huge amount from Leia's perspective in a lot of places where you'd think we would. It's just we hear about her doing stuff. Mm -hmm. You'd probably get a lot of the same thing that like we see with Corrin in this, where she's got those latent abilities that are still doing something, right. but she's something not really like in tingling charge. and back of her neck. Don't don't do this. Do this. Yeah. Yeah. 
And she's trying to uh, quote odds and Han's always there and Corellian's hate. Oh my God. Here There's times so many life. references to that in this book. So I, I wish that this didn't annoy me like so much, but it just does. There's so many references to, let me see. I've, I've got a list somewhere and there's just, there's just so many needless references to the original trilogy. Uh, let's see. One thing though, too, that one connection that I found cool. I'm going through my notes is I'm pretty sure that the so Tycho when he crashes on Coruscant and is captured by the Empire, he was using one of the ties that captured Bakura, which I thought was a neat little um, like what he's doing his reconnaissance before he's yeah. Um, I thought that was a neat little thing. Uh, I'm trying to find any references in my notes, but I have oh, a few. We have yeah, we have one to. Leia talks about, um, I would agree, as one Corellian has put it, if you anger a Wookiee, you shouldn't be surprised at having your arm tore off. So clearly yeah. a reference. Oh, that was something else with Akbar that I found really off-putting, was everything that Akbar says is like a reference to water. And I feel uh, like if yes. you spend that much time with him, it's got to get really grating. <laughs> like, we get it, the waves, Akbar. Like, Jesus. He says the word tide probably three times. Mm -hmm. You frolic in the tide, you get dragged down by the undertow and eaten by a crack, something. Everything he says has to be water. It, it's like yeah. he's got some contractual obligations there. That right. I mean, there's not. We're we're not really in the um, in the nuance right now. <laughs> These aren't the most like. Uh, yeah, they're, they're just not the most nuanced stories generally. Um, speaking of things that I've been taking care of, we also have references to tap caps in this one. So I think that's all three books now have at least or at least two of them have references to tap caps, which is nice. Here's one quote too. Corn or Corn Horn has an annoying facility of beating those kind of odds. Um, oh, here's another one. The Jedi Knights maintain there was no such thing as luck, just the Force. Apparently, all the Jedi Knights maintain that. Not just Obi Wan once. Lieutenant Darklighter, I'm a Corellian. I have no use for odds. Webb smiled broadly, putting as much confidence in it as he could. <sighs> okay, I need to cheer myself up. Let's talk about um. Let's talk about corn banging a uh, Salonian, a, a rodent. <laughs> not a rodent. Okay, not a rodent, but a. Uh, first of all, Corey, aren't you a big fan of Salonians? Uh, in my Star Wars Edge of the Empire tabletop role playing game, uh, yeah, you're, I you're play playing a as one, right? So right, I can. So do you want to uh, regale us with Corin's story of uh, meeting and wooing Chertle or Chertle the Salonian? I don't want to do it because I want to hear you. I mean, how, how much detail do we need to go in with it? Do we need to read Mirage? As much as possible. Yellis, old story? Okay. Uh, I need to find a keyword where I can find this. Um, infertile. That's that's the best. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you it comes up. Absolutely. No turtle wasn't fertile. <laughs> the turtle wasn't fertile. <laughs> You know what's funny too? I, I I wikied her after the book to see if she was in anything. Her descriptor is an infertile Salonian. <laughs> I guess I get that fertility is an important part of Salonian culture, but can you imagine if like there was a random human character that was infertile and it was like Josephine was an infertile human from Coruscant? <laughs> <laughs> That's just it comes before even her species. Her yeah, her uh, main sorry. identity is just being infertile. So let's, let's give a bit of backstory, and I know we're jumping. I just, I just couldn't. I've been too excited to talk about this. So it all comes up because Gavin, uh, Gavin's like super into a Seer Sailor, who is a future Rogue Squadron pilot and someone who they meet in Invisisec, which is kind of a, a place on Coruscant where all the unwanted parts of society, which in Imperial society largely means aliens, kind of were congregating and starting their own movement. And she's she hints at being from. Uh, another intelligence group or paramilitary yeah, like group, which we'll, intelligence we'll get into time. later, yeah. uh, and doesn't come super clean with why she's there. But Gavin falls in love with her, and they are actually they're a couple for pretty much six for months. The rest I think. Of... Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, you were talking about Gavin. Yeah, yeah. Gavin for Darklighter. until like the Vong War, at least. Right? Yeah, like anytime Gavin is mentioned as being with anyone, it's it's a seer. So I think. There together the whole time. I, 
It's not something I've put a lot of time into making sure I'm correct on this little factoid. So I find that very if, hard to uh, believe. If anyone is unsure on that, or also make sure you look up, make sure you look up a picture of her on um, on Star Wars Wiki too, because it like <laughs> it spends like 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 any time a woman is mentioned in this book, any time, there's at least a paragraph about her being beautiful, and that isn't limited to just humans. So when she first comes up. It's like, oh, she had silky fur and like, and it, like talks about how beautiful she is. And then you, you, you Google like her and the Star Wars wiki and it's like horse face both. And they're, they're not a good looking species. I'm sorry. There's a lot of Friendship is Magic fans who are going to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm about to be canceled. <laughs> um, OK, but but yeah, so you're saying they they're a couple at least at least six months more. At least to Sarge Revenge. Mm. I don't know if it ever comes up again, but there's no reason to believe they're... Uh, I, I think she is things. mentioned in New Jedi Order at one point. Yeah, a lot of the people... So the two people who join Rogue Squadron in this book uh, mm. are Asir Sailor and Aniri Forge. They become full-fledged members by oh, the I next I think book. I lost you, Corey. Uh, can any... uh, Sorry, I, can you repeat that? I I just lost that. Um, so there's that little... two. You can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. so there's two uh, two characters that are introduced in this book that become full Rogue Squadron members next book, which are Aniri Forge and uh, and Asir Sailor, and they actually stay as Rogue Squadron pilots for a long time. I know Aniri is at least. Uh, which are both super convenient War. that they're good enough to or fly yeah. in Rogue Squadron. Well, it just happens to turn out that uh, Asir was like a. A first cousin of Pes- Peshk or something, a second cousin. Of course. And Aniri Forge is Lu Jane Forge's sister. So it's But also like the girlfriend of a drug dealer, essentially. Yeah, just to start with, but as soon as he reveals himself to be slightly unreliable, then she changes her ways. But I I feel like they he uh he explains that yeah, well enough. It's fine. I, I'm I'm okay case. with that, yeah. So yeah. it it worked out alright. But uh but they get introduced and they're they're gonna be with us for a while. Uh-huh. So, uh, I we we should probably jump back to the important uh, stuff. Well, we're pretty far in the future here, and we we were going to talk about ferrets. We didn't we didn't get all the way through that. Uh, I was trying to get away from that. No, you didn't read the thing yet. You how much of this am I reading? All of it. What do you mean? Okay. Uh, Jesus. Turtle rule war. <laughs> was a female Salonian who had been sent to our unit to get some training. It was a cultural exchange program. She was tall, at least two meters, and slender. Salonias are all lithe, and she was covered with a relatively short black fur that glistened with a silver blue when the light hit it right. Definitely gorgeous, definitely humanoid, and definitely not human. The annual Corsac yeah. Awards Ball was coming up, and she didn't know anyone. Salonia said a good to be... part. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, you don't need to read. It. You don't need to read all. Let's, I'll just, I'll just a brief backstory. Basically, Corin's working with Corsac, Corellian Security. They get a, a transfer student. Basically, she's a Salonian. Basically, a giant ferret. I disagree that she's humanoid, but anyway, what happens? Uh, well, they date for six months. They have a wonderful time at the ball. Uh, but what they found out was that the the chemistry wasn't right. Is how uh, is how mm-hmm. Corin puts it. And what he means by that is that Corin was allergic to her, and Corin's sweat was highly acidic for a human, still within regular ranges. If, you, if you've ever listened to the Rooster Teeth podcast, this is something that Gus Sorolla talks about a lot, where his <laughs> acid will kind of melt his, ta- his laptop. Uh, <laughs> and this is something that Corin had as well, and it was enough to cause a lot of skin irritation for... Uh, it would mess up the fur, I think. Uh, this isn't something yeah. I took... A lot of notes on because I didn't think oh, I'd be I in charge of. Why are you not doing this part? <laughs> uh, I don't know. You basically got it all. They're allergic to each other, but the the real juicy part at, at the end, Gavin is like, because Gavin's what eighteen at this point. I, I think, think he's he joined when he was sixteen, and this is only a month after the end. Of okay, the so he's sixteen. Listen, Maybe Gavin's basically something. asking for Corin's approval to to bang a Bothan, and um, I don't remember exactly what what. Gavin says, but Corin is like, um, or sorry, I don't remember what Corin says, but Gavin is like, was it? And then basically asking, was the sex between the two of them good, despite the fact that, yes, one is a ferret 
And Corrin says something like, he winks at him and says something like, the best I ever had or something. That sounds close enough to what he said. Yeah. Which actually kind of makes sense because we talked about, like, this book is just, it's just, it's very weird about how it treats, like, sex and stuff. Like, very sexually charged. You can actually rank the attractiveness of the women at this point based on Corn's descriptions. Because at one point he'll compare it. It's like, okay, a Reese is better looking than a Yella, but a Yella is worse looking than Mirax. You can make an official like table of like the attractiveness of the women. I'm pretty sure uh, it's a Reese, Mirax, and then a Yella. According to Corrin. But yeah. then again, Corrin's into Salonians. It goes Churchill, Arisi. <laughs> Churchill, big gap. Arisi. We shouldn't be kink shaming Corrin. That's true. But then again, um, I, I think I had some more. Is there anything else you want to talk about? I'm just trying to see if I had any more romantic. <laughs> we might want to. Well, it, it is kind of weird that he goes from like his final decision to not have sex with Arisi. Then the next page is him asking Mirax out after the Battle of Court. Well, I guess that's a couple weeks later, but is it? It's hard. It's hard. To the f- timeline gets kind of weird in some places where yeah. they have the speeder chase through Coruscant, and then uh, there's some mention that that was five days ago. Oh, and okay. The next time that. we see Wedge, so there was a lot of stuff there. The, I guess the one thing that I kind of noted about the romantic stuff was that when Cor and Narisi kiss, it's like. They're in the middle of a conversation with Winter about Alderaan, mm. and right. Winter's just standing there staring at them, and Corrin mm. just decides to... And I just felt really bad for Winter in that so, situation. Like that, you, you don't do that to your friends. You don't just like no. start making out with someone in the middle of a Although, if you're going to do it to any of the women, it would be Winter, because she's like a pro. I love Winter. Um, do you want to give some background on her, Corrin? Uh, <laughs> her, Corrin, and... Um, what was I going to say? Her, Corn and Tycho. On specifically the three? Well, or, yeah, or just just generally, I guess, her, because like, yeah, so, so she first she appears, comes in yeah. in the Thrawn trilogy is where she comes up first. But this is our first time on the podcast really dealing with her. Right. Uh, where she's kind of she's uh, a nanny for Leia's kids, but also probably the best New Republic Intel officer or Intel agent that they have. Right. She's, What's her uh, code name again during the... Uh, they say it's Targeter, but I feel like that was something she... She has another one, though, doesn't she? During the... I like, doesn't she have one during the Galactic Civil War? She has a bunch of them, and I can't remember any other than Targeter right now. But uh, her and Tycho are married later, so mm. she's Alderanian as well. Uh, she was kind of raised with Leia. Uh, and so Korn was kind of... Uh, talking about Tycho to Winter, and they were having a discussion about whose life was harder. Right. Where, uh, that part was Corrin really was weird. trying to downplay it, downplay what Tycho went through, and Winter explains, like, yeah, you saw your dad get killed, but then Tycho was on the phone with his entire family when Alderaan got destroyed. <laughs> Thought he just lost the connection, but no, that was the Death Star. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Winter's, Winter's a cool character, though. Like, she's she's like dangerously competent <laughs> although later on the bit with oral where they're trying to get through the gases and like she doesn't figure that out i thought was a bit weird yeah but yeah she's a great character i, I don't know i always like when she pops up although it doesn't make any sense you're right because she, she is more or less given nanny duty because she's like she was leia's friend growing up on alderaan right and it's always yeah. talking about how they look very similar and whatnot and i think sometimes it, it mentions in Thrawn, maybe sometimes she would pretend to be Leia or whatever. Um, but yeah, but she's got white hair, which is, of course, the person named Winter has white hair. <laughs> We've uh, we kind of talked about what the plan was for getting into Coruscant, and uh, did we? Well, we talked about that they wanted to get to Coruscant, and they mm. decided that rogues infiltrating and bringing down the shields would be the way to do it, right? Uh, which is what most of this book is about, but yeah. The first step in that plan is that they are going to go to Kessel, get mm-hmm. some guys out of prison, especially Black Sun Operatives, which is a criminal organization that was... A nasty uh, one, too. Very nasty and shut down by the Empire. They want to get some of the worst people from that organization that are still on Kessel. Uh, 
And they want to send them to Coruscant along with Rogue Squadron. For some reason. Start messing stuff up for the Empire. Basically, yeah. Like it, it makes it makes very little sense. I, I don't know if they just wanted to have a like a Kessel moment or what, but like you've got to hold that planet afterwards. And like the Empire the Empire can deal with shit like that. There's like a whole bit about how the Black Sun was bad, but under the Empire it wasn't that bad because you know, they would just kill you. <laughs> well, I think but, like, when Korn's thinking about it, it was like They'd only ki- at some point they had their own kind of honor because they would only kill who they were looking for. Yeah. But then they started getting worse, where they would kill who they were looking for and everyone's family as well. Yeah. Uh, but it does kind of turn out that the only person who they bring from, uh, from Kessel who is especially helpful is an mm-hmm. Forge. Yeah. And so a lot of it was just kind of set up to get her out. She wasn't uh, even a prisoner, though. <laughs> yeah. So. Mm. But I, I yeah, I, I found that a bit weird, though, because like the relationship between Morth Duel. Um, so basically, they go to Kessel. They're like, OK, so we'll take some bad guys off your hand. Um, but we need to get good guys as well, like because it, it was an imperial prison. They got some real nasty people, but they've also got some some good people. Um, so the deal is, you know, we take a good person and say this one really good person is worth two bad people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the New Republic is taking three, and it's kind of like an even balance sheet. Yeah. Why didn't Morth kind of Duel... Hoping... Sorry, go ahead. Why didn't Morth Duel just throw those dudes into a spider hole? Yeah, he was in charge of everything there. He could have just gotten rid of anyone he wanted to. But I, I guess if there was like their own power structures within the prison, yeah, and everything guess. broke up. Like It's not like they were super imprisoned. They were just stuck on Kessel, and Morth Duel was kind of stuck with them. So he started trying for a power play to kill like Fleury Voru and Zekatine, then everyone would have killed him. It's, the thing that's least clear to me is how he managed to keep control in that system. But, right. I mean, it's kind of the same setup when they go there in Jedi Academy. Yeah. Well, it's 10 years later, same guy's in charge, and he seems. Is it really? Yeah. Guess, incredibly yeah. incompetent is. I think. What's, the the, what's, what's his buddy's to... name? Skinrax or Skidrax or. Skidmark. Skink ramps or Skidmark, yeah. What is it again? I, it's something like that. Uh, I try not to wiki too much during the <laughs> War the Duel associate. Oh, what was his name? Oh, I'm not going to be able to find it. But they're, they're kind of... Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I think I lost you there for a second while I was typing. I was, while you were searching, I was just going to go on more with the... Yeah, yeah, uh, they were kind of hoping that the Black Sun operatives they got would be able to unite some of the criminal elements on Coruscant and help them with what they needed to do, which uh, they had a plan worked out eventually with uh, Voru, where they were going to uh, work more with combined resources to get computer right. cores, and then they'd have control over the shields. But the plan they end up going with at the end of the book, which is hijacking a construction machine, fly- forming a storm, <laughs> and then flying into that storm to blow up a backup generator to bring we the Zeus now down boys temporarily, uh ends up not being especially like the the black sun operatives end up not being especially useful for any of that which right. you don't know going in that that's going to be what you're doing but the, <laughs> yeah. the starting point of free the black sun step two question mark step three coruscant <laughs> probably could have used a bit more fleshing out beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's so funny it, it it would be a better mission for maybe like wraith squadron or like just or skink snakes that's the guy's name by the way but well, um, isn't it partially coruscant being what it is that makes wedge want wraith squadron to be a thing where rogue doesn't have quite the same ground capabilities that they, they yeah and and kind of the ability to act outside of yeah traditional because uh we're gonna be coming up to and up, up the point where the New Republic is saying we need to focus on Zinj, whereas mm-hmm. the back to war needs to happen. So mm-hmm. the false rogue squadron kind of operates. Right. But... Um, Die Ghost has a good point, too. Uh, he says freeing the Black Sun was Borsk's idea to get Bothans out of Kessel. That is a good point, yeah. because they do get a lot of Bothans out of Kessel. And it is Borsk who has the idea, because like that would never be something like, like Akbar's idea, because he hates kind of the underworld. Um, 
Oh, yeah, it makes sense why uh, why Borsk would want that. It just it, the the connection to the operation isn't quite as clear as mm-hmm. they would have wanted it to be. So right, yeah. No, that, it's it is what it is. There's a lot of kind of ridiculousness in this book, more so than the last one. Yeah, significantly uh, more so. A lot less fighter piloting as well. We get to the point after that where they are going to be infiltrating into Castle. Or not into Kessel. They go to Kessel, they get the people they're going to be infiltrating into Coruscant. But mm. uh, the in actual infiltration, they're split into groups. They're not told which members of Rogue Squadron are actually going, but it turns out all of them are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Corrin is grouped with Arisi, and they group and they meet up with Winter. Their disguise is that uh, they are... <laughs> so She's like a Kuwati noble. Yeah, so Arisi is a Kuwati noble. And... He's a concubine, essentially, or not a concubine, like a a a, a breeder. I, I forget what the actual name for them is. Yeah, uh, child bearer or not bearer, yeah. child giver. <laughs> so the the higher classes on uh, on Kuwat, in order to prevent inbreeding and to just keep their family lines going, tell them they have uh, they have these middle class families that would raise a child as a Talbin, uh, mm-hmm. thank you guys, where uh, they got the best education, the best everything, and then they were used almost exclusively for breeding uh, and kind of kept then kept around as a nanny. They would raise the kids, but the, the kids from them would think of themselves as being part of the noble family, and mm-hmm. their parent from that family would be seen as their actual parent. Uh, and then while they'd still have that caretaker the caretaker Talbin was not considered their actual biological parent in the same way. Uh, So the middle-class family benefits from a huge payment for the Talbin. The Talbin gets to live with uh, the noble family, and then the noble family gets to breed with what they see as the best option for them, not have to intermarry with other noble families to the same way that the miter uh, interbreed with themselves, and not Mm -hmm. lose any legitimacy. So it's... uh, Kind of a gross arrangement. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And they have to... uh, So Corrin is walking around in these huge bundled clothes while Larissi is acting all entitled. Uh, I have a good quote for this, by the way. Go for it. Because this is one of the the, uh, examples where Michael Stackpole was obviously going... (laughs) Anyway... Well, I won't get into this. But, uh, okay. Thus, though she was fully clothed, anyone with enough intelligence to outwit a Kowakian monkey lizard could imagine what a Reese looked like naked. And the idea of having to share a cabin with her doubtless seemed a wonderful joy to plenty of men. Yikes. And there was the... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Stackpole was a thirsty dude. Uh, there was uh, an explicit mention of whether it was worth her treating him like shit yeah. for how attractive she was. Like, okay. And they actually uh, say no, so... Yeah, well... Which is yeah. weird, because she's at the top of um, Corrin's pyramid of sexiness. <laughs> we need a graphic for the next the next episode. So I can tell can you what it is right now. And the top at the top is a Salonian, and then there's the Human League, which is significantly far below. It's like a Salonian, Bothan, Arisi, everyone else. <laughs> for anyone following along at home but so that's our first matter because he was he was blocked by the force the entire time anyway <laughs> they meet up with winter who gets to experience all of this firsthand these people that she just met getting angry at her for downplaying the seriousness of alderaan's destruction then starts making out with this other chick right immediately. uh the other group that we have is Wedge, Pash Kraken, and Yellow Siri, who's Corrin's mm-hmm. old Corsac partner. She doesn't uh, know Corrin's there either, which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, she got sent there by Gil Bastra, who is kind of their mentor. That was where mm-hmm. her identity was kind of set up. And then she became a rebel operative, uh, I believe, after losing Derek, which is her husband. Uh, right. Losing yeah. track of him, not. Yeah. But uh, then we have Mirax Tarek, who brought in every other member of Rogue Squadron. Mm-hmm. So, Corrin, it's Arisi, funny because Legend Pash. Corrin separate... is like. Sorry, go ahead. I lost you for a second there. Uh, no, go ahead. I was just oh, no. recapping. I was just, I was just saying it's funny because like Corrin gets to travel like first class, like, and he's like not used to being like 
a rich snob to people, and then other people are like traveling in the brig, basically. Yeah, they get sent. Uh, Mirex and everyone else get sent to Invisisac because most of them are aliens, and they couldn't have mm-hmm. uh, had the same position. Like point, uh, yeah. they meet up. That's how they meet up with Asir, and uh, you have Gavin is Gavin and Rosati are the two humans in that group, and I think everyone else is an alien because Oral is a Gond, uh, Noir is a Twi'lek. Uh, mm-hmm. other people are there as well. <laughs> but, Gavin's kind of dirty looking, so it makes sense. He's from Tatooine, so no one thinks that's worth anything. Oh yeah, then Wedge is, Wedge has the, uh, he's like being the injured Imperial, which I thought was a cool disguise. Yeah, and the, uh, the person who lets them in is like, yeah, they should have just, the MD droids should have just let you die. <laughs> which, <laughs> oh, yeah. you could which he that. doesn't say directly to him, but it's close enough that Wedge can hear it. Yeah. Like, yeah how CL wonderful how they t- too, I Wonderful how they talk about their veterans. <laughs> like, you should you should have died. <laughs> you look like <laughs> shit from just FYI. But in all of this, what we haven't mentioned is that Wedge has smuggled in someone else. Mr. Tycho Selchu, who everyone thought was on Nakivzor, and many believe to have died. When Zinj mm-hmm. attacked Nakivzor after mm-hmm. a meeting between the Provisional Council there. Right. Uh, and this is, to the best of my ability, or best of my understanding, is what the title of the book refers to? Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess so. I I never really thought about it like that, to be honest. I always figured it was because the scheme is so, like, harebrained. But in the end, Gavin is the one who comes up with it. Yeah. Because anything um. else, it's like... Akbar's gamble and then Borsk's gamble and then Gavin's gamble. The only thing where it's like Wedge is the one making this decision without anyone else is yeah. the idea to bring Tycho in as their backup. Yeah, I guess you're right. Which pays off for everything except for the fact that it's what Not causes Corin yeah. to die or to die. And because <laughs> uh, at this point in the book, you're still not supposed to be entirely clear on whether uh, Tycho is the traitor or not because they do highlight a lot that there is a traitor. Mirax attempted to get off planet. She was supposed to leave before any of them, uh, but her identity got compromised. And then right. when Zeka Tyne betrays them when they're doing the raid on the computer thing, uh, he points out that someone had betrayed them beforehand for mm-hmm. him to have even been in a position to betray them because Curtin Lore had uh, had kidnapped Zeka and shot him and yeah. told him you kind of you have to work for us now, otherwise you're screwed there is sort of one point where it kind of suggests that um it's not Tycho because there's a meeting that Tycho's at and i'm pretty sure curtain lore says we can't report on that meeting because our our spy isn't there basically yeah um so i I think it's so hard because you know we obviously know what's happened i think you can you can um and you, you can figure out that it's not Tycho, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, also, Evan has the good point that it could be Corrin's Gambit, which is banging a Salonian. So. There, you know there are a few hints, like, uh, we've already mentioned in the previous episode who the traitor is, so mm-hmm. I, I'm never clear how far into spoilers we're going yeah, that, it's, it's, Yeah, it's a Reese. It's a Reese. Uh, but there are a few hints at it, uh, like, Usually there are attempts from people. It might just be me reading too much into it because I know mm-hmm. going in who it is. But when they're getting set up on the planet, uh, Arisi brings up at one point trying to do or trying to figure out who's actually going to be there uh, in a way that other people don't quite do. Ah, uh, gotcha. Where I'll see if I can find when they're when corn and Arisi are talking to wedge when they're in that little meeting in his office uh mm-hmm. so who do we report to they ask all that will be in your briefing file wedge says even i do not know what your cover will be or what your travel arrangements are and i doubt sincerely i'll have a way to contact you Arisi says you'll be going though won't you it only makes sense that they would send all of us not just two right so if Arisi is reporting back to the empire she's trying to find out as much as she can and uh then also with the betrayal of Jace, like it, there's a few hints at it, nothing super clear, but I feel like there's a lot more 
hints that it's not Tycho. Yeah, uh, I agree. And that if Tycho were a traitor, it would be like the. The, the one thing case. is when they see him in the the bar because it's corn and corn is generally reliable as well. Yeah, that that I I didn't like that as much in high. What's the explanation for that? Anyway, he was I meeting don't... someone else and he didn't know Kurt and Lore was there. But the oh, way it's kind of put by that's weird. I don't like that. That's yeah. Bad. The way it's put by corn is that he was standing there talking to Kurt and Lore, right? Or something very close to that. Like yeah. So what was Kurt and Lore doing there? Was he meeting Reese? He couldn't uh, have been because Arisi is back in the apartment. No, Lore was just there doing other stuff. But Corin sees but that's, Lore that's like the twice. shadiest bar on like all of Coruscant. Yeah, the dude's clearly got like a drug problem or something. And then I think uh, I don't think Curtin knew Tycho was there. Did he? Like, there's nothing that gives that no. away because obviously you're yeah, still supposed he's to the believe. surprise at the end. Yeah. Like, but maybe maybe Curtin was like there watching them abduct Celestins or something. Yeah, who's there? Well, the there was that sequence where like six things happen at once and all happen to be <sighs> like uh, they go through the the speeder goes through the window into Wedge's apartment. It's my least favorite part of the book. Five chapters later, it turns out that was Corin that did that, and yeah. then he he ends his chase by jumping into everyone else in Invisec. Um, there's yeah. So th- this, th- I mean, this book really just. It's kind of bad for having coincidences to the the degree that it does. Like the allies they find being able to pilot good enough to be in Rogue Squadron. Um, that whole situation with like... Okay, so basically... I don't even remember. That that whole... There's like a big chase and it's very convoluted. Um, who is Corrin actually running from? I don't remember. Uh, there were the people in the bar that were trying to just chase him and kill him uh, because they didn't like him. Mm-hmm. And because he was just so he, a higher class human in the establishment, I think they were trying to fight him. Then he fights back, runs, steals a speeder, and gets chased by some Black Sun people. I think is right. what happened. Uh, and one of those Black Sun people um, crashes their speeder bike, and wouldn't you know it, the bike crashes right through the the room of the apartment that Wedge is staying in. But that Wedge is all. in at that point with Mirax. At Winter. that point, like right as they walk in and start talking about. New Republic shit. Was that was it Zeka chasing him? This was before. Um, I, I think it was Black Sun people. It I involved don't... him, but I don't think he was like because they all end up obviously at that firefight. That's when, uh, like him and Zeka, along with Aniri, mm-hmm. end up at the Invisec firefight that's going on at that point. After Gavin has been accused of being a bigot for not wanting to dance with. A well, singer. they're getting shot up by stormtroopers. The stormtroopers get in there. Then Corrin and Zeka get in there. Right. Corrin uh, goes to save Gavin, and then Gavin and Corrin save Aniri, but Zeka leaves, and that's when Kurt and Lore captures him. So mm. it's everything happens at once. Yeah. And yeah, that's how and Aniri that's decides. That's the main that problem with this book, in my opinion. Like, I don't know. It's just there's too much random shit that happens, and it's just it's kind of messy. Well, it kind like, of that part of the book reads more like the last season of Arrested Development, where it's all these <laughs> things. You're getting five chapters of everyone's view of a specific yeah. set of events at the same yeah. time to- or subsequently. And then it's kind of hard to suss out the exact timeline because until That's it true. all comes together, you're not you're not aware of the fact that this is all happening at once. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And it's it's kind of weird just generally how like the the book is set up, because when they first arrive at Coruscant, like. Wedge spends the first few weeks going to museums and shit. Yeah. Well, then, uh, <laughs> Mira, is it Mirax that finds them by just assuming they're going to go to the Endor exhibit because they're all... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's like, yeah, you guys are Starfire fighter pilots. You'll definitely be there. This one museum in all of this planet-wide city. <laughs> so they spend the first, the first two weeks doing that, going to bars, shit like that, and then... Uh, Tycho shows up and he's like, "Yeah, we got forty-eight hours." <laughs> FYI. Yeah. the The last coincidence that happens around this point is that we talk about, or we hear again about Black Asp, which is an immobilizer mm. four eighteen, commanded mm. by Ula Yor, who came up in Ooh. Yor. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> came up in the last book. Uh, she's the one that's uh, commanding the interdictor that the Rogue Squadron pilots fight. Uh, between the books, she was also 
the one who I believe she's the one who or that ship is the one that pulled Broar Jace out of yeah. hyperspace. Uh, because right. there's only one interdictor in this half of the galaxy. Uh, in the New Republic... <laughs> Star Destroyer either. It's just a... <laughs> just yeah. a cruiser. <laughs> it's all we got. <laughs> the, uh, so the events in the last book, though, before that it happened, but I guess before... Uh, or after that it happened, but before uh, the events of this book. The... Uh, no, I messed that up. In the last book, before any of this had happened... The uh, flight commander on that interdictor was sent off to be with Thrawn in the Unknown Regions because Isard was still sending him some personnel. Mm -hmm. But uh, this had pissed off Ilor and right. caused the lack of the loss of their flight coordinator had made her and her entire crew take Black Asp to the New Republic and they joined the New Republic and they were then... Uh, Which is pretty drastic. Yeah. So we don't know how they felt about the political order, but they were then put in charge of uh, getting the fleet into Coruscant. So if the shields were still up while Rogue Squadron was on the surface... Uh, I like this part, by the way. This part's cool. Yeah, this was a cool tactic. It's just... Timothy Zanian. <laughs> the fact that they trusted her with it after two days mm -hmm. in the New Republic was... So sorry, I'll let you... Ex you want... Yeah, so basically the plan is... Um, it's kind of a dumb plan, actually. And if... The Empire didn't want it to work. It wouldn't have. So there's an interdictor cruiser sitting in the Coruscant system somewhere, but not right next to the planet. Close enough that the Empire manages to detect it and probably could have blown it up quite easily, but whatever. Um, basically, the ship is sitting there along the hyperspace route that the incoming fleet is going to take. If the Coruscant shields are still up, then the fleet obviously isn't going to be able to take the planet. So the Black Asp or the Corsica Rainbow, whatever. Um, is to put on the interdiction bubble, pull them out of hyperspace early, and then presumably they jump away. Yeah, so um, I th I think the the idea that the Empire could have just blown her up, I think that's more just because of the timeline being kind of weird at this point in the book, where she probably wasn't there for more than the 20 minutes or whatever, because they were yeah, far enough out that right. they'd be safe from the Imperial forces. Right, that makes uh, sense. Yeah. And then, because it the, was the, all in a very strict The two victory Star timeline. Destroyers? <laughs> yeah. Well, Triumph and Monarch... But it, she was far enough out that they, the, if this fleet would have been safe, it means that position she was in would have been safe. So mm -hmm. if she was only there for a couple hours at most, where they knew she was there, but they weren't entirely sure what she was doing, or as far as the New Republic knows, they weren't entirely sure what she was doing, uh, mm -hmm. then she probably would have been safe. I'm not, I don't have too much of a problem with her being there as long as it wasn't for a couple days, which is what it can seem mm -hmm. like in the book. But I don't think it was. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Also, the Triumph and the Monarch are both uh, victories. Were they VSDs? Yeah. I thought they were VSD. There were VSDs, and there was also ISDs, which were the No, they're victories. I just checked it, which is weird. Did he just... Well, because it also says they're stronger than the Golan, so I... Yeah. Did he just not know what a VSD was? I think I think he didn't know what a Victory Star Destroyer was, which is weird, because they're pretty important in the, uh, the Thrawn stuff, because Thrawn yeah. used victories a lot. So um, in they were having a stalemate with Emancipator and Liberator, and they right, needed so more Ramonda to come in and turn the, the New tide basically got like VSD. Yeah, because it seems like the New Republic's got like at least fifteen capital ships because it talks about like all the named ones, and then it talks about unnamed capital ships as well. Um. Yeah, but it must it might have been late. Oh yeah, it was the Star Wars Wikipedia, which clarified them as being victories but i guess it's it is technically ambiguous within the book isn't it i think it's i think they're just i think they are isds could be the wiki could it be is kind of ambiguous on it but i'm pretty sure mm. like the way i was reading at least it was those two Me were too. isds and then there were vsds as well but it also That's says the I... biggest threat they had was the vsds right like the most damage was coming from that but i, I figured the the two isds kind of came in later but yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Regardless, I I assumed, but I yeah, it, it's just weird. It, it's a weird kind of tactical setup. But I do like, yeah, because Zon played with hyperspace interdiction technology and in that like a lot of, uh, in ways like that too, with like the Thrawn pincer and stuff. So it's kind of cool to see it used like that. It's just one of those things where you read it and you're like, that makes sense. Yeah. A lot of Rogue Squadron, like, it, it does the fighter combat really well, but when you get above that, it gets kind of yeah. 
wonky. I so agree. yeah, I mean the battle here is okay. I think. Yeah. Well, the only it's... real tactical information we get is like they were engaging the Golans over one area, and then you have the yeah uh, the Monromanda slash maneuver. Right. So they, and then they kind of cut to afterwards, right in the middle of it. Mm hmm. So. Yeah, well, it talks too about the rebels bringing like weird ships. Like they have like a lot of basically little Millennium Falcons. frigates being shuttles that were refit and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But they um, were also troop landers. Yeah, that is true. Is it the Star Wars Alliances game that has a cool scene of. Or is it, I forget if it's called a Rebellion or Alliance. The old Star Wars computer game. Um, strategy game where it has a cool shot of the uh, Alliance landing on Coruscant. Have you ever seen that before? Uh, I think that was Star Wars Rebellion. Yeah, Rebellion. Supremacy I can, I can... in the UK. Yeah. That wasn't a subtitle. It was just called Supremacy mm -hmm. when it was released in the UK. Star Wars I Rebellion like Supremacy sick. in the UK was not a thing. <laughs> Supremacy in the UK. <laughs> That'd be interesting. But, uh... So... That's all going on. That was their plan for the orbital attack. Uh, mm -hmm. Initially, or not initially, but the, the most solid plan they kind of come up with for bringing down the shields is that they are going to get access to the computer, to the main planetary computer, which a lot of this is being written before uh, a lot of modern technology with computers like internet and all that would have been uh, super fleshed out. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, it's, it's, it's always kind of like, weird reading the Star Wars tech from that. Yeah, period. it's kind of like I, th I think it's like an, <laughs> an integer overflow or something crazy. Like, yeah. Um, but yeah, but there. So and it, it's actually seems like a pretty good plan too, because I think at one point, yeah, it wasn't a bad plan, and but it fails obviously because they're compromised by Arisi. Yeah, they were gonna. They were essentially a bunch of memory cores for the computer that they were gonna put mm -hmm. new code in, and then uh, get the Imperials to take the compromised cores, put them in, mm -hmm. and then they'd have access to all the computer systems, and then they could turn the shields on and off at will without having to destroy anything. Which but, would have been a better option than what they ended up yeah, doing, because it, it doesn't involve bringing down any hardware. They'd be able to put the shields back mm -hmm. online as soon as they needed to, so Zinj can swoop in. Yeah. But uh, but they do kind of repair what they broke, like on the fly with the uh, constructor droid. Yeah, they they get betrayed by Zekathine with this. This is where mm -hmm. Neri ends up killing him. Oh, uh, right. It is Zeka here, not Arisi. Yeah, well, Arisi is the one who would have been telling the Imperials a lot of stuff beforehand. But this is where Zeka was like, mm -hmm. Corin, you have a traitor because I wouldn't have the opportunity to do this betrayal if someone else hadn't already betrayed you. Right. But uh, and then that gets Oren even more pissed at Tycho. Uh, yeah. But they end up having a firefight, blowing up all the cores, and uh, that's when they're all angry. Corin goes to t to wedge again about Tycho, thinking it's him, and Gavin comes up with the new plan to have a storm. And there was kind mm -hmm. of in this conversation where Gavin is putting forward the storm idea. Uh, I'm not I think it was a reference to Dark Empire where they were saying like oh yeah even the no emperor could, couldn't control yeah. a storm like that which kind of a reference to to I I kind of took it as a reference to the four storm destroying everything yeah obviously that's much lighter but yeah that's kind of what I took it to um yeah I I, I don't know it's yeah it, it is funny how Gavin is the one who ends up um coming up with the plan and he he uh he ends up coming up with it because someone says take the world by storm and he's like ah <laughs> and and the kind of while that happens there's also like they're in like this weird room where there's like kind of an internal system like precipitation and stuff and then yeah. it's dripping down so i think they kind of I, I kind of took that to be like a representation of what they were going to do i love that scene because it's like they're in this dank underground thing so that's probably like gross Basically, mm, sewer like water. Shit. Everyone else is trying to avoid it, but then you just got Gavin's Gavin a fucking standing idiot. under it. Pardon my French. <laughs> He's got his drinking sweat from people. <laughs> but, yeah, so we'll probably talk a little bit more about the Kratos virus itself uh, right at the end because yeah. we're getting into 
uh, that part of the plan later, like with yeah. the Kratos trap and back to war more. Yeah, but, the Imperial side. Yeah. Uh, but they're... It's also garbage juice. Because there's garbage in the middle of the room. That's like sweating. Yeah, it, it's not a good place to be. But was it, I think it was that engagement uh, with the computer cores where Tycho does the fly-through with his N95s, right? There wasn't a firefight um, after that. What do you mean? When Tycho shows up for the first time and reveals that he was oh, there. Oh, Tycho, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was he's that got just the one, I think. He's got the, yeah, he's got the one with him. The, but then that and the, uh, the transport as well. Yeah. But uh, so they basically decide that they are going to uh, start the storm. They're going to get the construction thing to kind of eat its way towards the uh, facility to get everyone out of the generators. Mm -hmm. But then they find out when that's all happening that there was a secondary facility, so Corn has to fly into the storm. Right. And gets a TIE interceptor to... Right, that well. part's pretty pretty unreal. Not in a terrible way. It's just, yeah, so basically they've got to take down, and this is where the orbital mirrors come into. Um, basically, they want a big thunderstorm to take out the the like the power station, right? And I guess it's only going to temporarily take down the power yeah. for the city because they can't they can't just outright destroy them because they need them working. Yeah. Um, so they as long as they it. had the shields down for just long enough to infiltrate, that's all they were trying to go for. So they were trying yeah. to find the least destructive way to bring down the power grid for a while. Mm -hmm. And they go with kind of, I mean, we do see references to it's weird because other this is really the only story that I can think of where Coruscant has these crazy thunder and lightning storms. Yeah, like in Plagueis, they talk about, I think it's Plagueis, they talk about. Like Coruscant's weather is a hundred percent controlled, and they just make it rain occasionally, like just for interesting weather. Yeah, the it was very much like this is what we need for the plot, and mm -hmm. I can I can see why the storms would happen, how they're talking about, but it was mm -hmm. definitely just I don't mind it yeah. something he had brought in for the convenience of that. But their their way to get the moisture into the air for the storms to happen was they would. And this is my favorite section of the book. <laughs> it's the best uh, by far, in my opinion. It's really fun. They would get a, an orbital mirror, which is supposed to be reflecting light, to point towards the water to heat the water, evaporate it a bit. But the crew on this orbital mirror includes the cousin of... Once-removed cousin. The once-removed cousin of Lorth Nita. <laughs> Virar Nita. Uh, the rest of his family had been, of Lorth's family, had been killed after. Don't give too many spoilers. Make a video on this, Corey. Okay. But <laughs> this guy is really just looking for his moment to shine. And he's yeah. given his moment to literally shine by the rebels, where he is uh, <laughs> helping bastard. with the. <laughs> helping with the rebel takeover, thinking that he is going to help make the planet slightly more comfortable for the Imperial leaders by redirecting <laughs> this light. And because if the Imperial leaders were uncomfortable, then bad things would happen. So he's doing his part in yeah, restoring... Even though it's nighttime, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's not very smart. Uh, yeah, so, like, being on an orbital mirror is, like, the worst job you can get because you don't do anything. It's all controlled by a computer on the ground. You're basically just fixing stuff or playing cards like Nita's buddies. <laughs> And yeah, so, so like Corey said, he thinks that he's like a, a vital part of the, like he's a vital cog within the empire and like how he, like today is the day like that people will remember the contribution he made to history as he is there while the orbital mirror moves. <laughs> Others, including the rest of the six man crew, saw Oset's service as punishment. The Virar Nita saw it as a noble duty. After all, he was entrusted with the care of a facility that made life on Imperial Center possible. Without Oset's 2711, Imperial Center would be just that much more uncomfortable. And if the people who ran the Empire were uncomfortable, well then things would just begin to fall apart entirely. So Virar Nita is saving the Empire from mild discomfort. Yep. It's a true hero. Up there with Tarkin, Vader. I don't know. I can't think of anyone else. <laughs> It, Tarkin, Vader, and Virar Nita. Yeah, Derekot. 
Those are the the big four. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's and then at the end, I mean, there's kind of a funny pit with his uh, the other officer there when the rebel fleet shows up. Of course, they're sitting in this unarmed. It's a giant mirror, basically, with probably some engines on it, some thrusters on it, and they're like, <laughs> because obviously he's related to Lorth Nita. So, who for those that don't know, he's the Imperial that um, he's like. It's kind of weird because he's in the Avenger, which is a Star Destroyer um, part of Death Squadron when they're tracking like Leia and Han and the Falcon. And he's like the Star Destroyer that's closest to the Falcon. And then when the Falcon does its little maneuver and gets away, it's the blame is put on him. And then he goes to see Vader and Vader chokes him. And that's where you get apology accepted. Um, Captain Nita or whatever. Um, so the basically the officer that's on Nita's ship now or on his mirror now is like, listen, just tell them that it was all a plan. Lorth Nita was actually a rebel sympathizer and that'll be fine. And obviously he's kind of just joking. He's like playing cards, not really paying attention. And Nita's like, really? We should do that? <laughs> Pettitson is, uh, that's, he, he's the best character in the book, I think. I agree. He he really knows what's up. Mm-hmm. There was an earlier part of the conversation where he just doesn't give a shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, he 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 sees the battle going on. He just doesn't want to die. He doesn't really care about any, literally <laughs> anything to do with who wins or loses. <laughs> it's like I got I got reflecting to do. <laughs> Go down without a fight, Lieutenant Nita? Pettitson frowned in Nita's direction. One proton torpedo and we go down without even a whimper. I'll take two. You want to sit with two? No, I want two more cards. A proton <laughs> torpedo is I want zero. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite yeah. line in the book. Yeah. And then, of course, the, uh, the mirror is used because they get control of the mirror on the ground. It's used to somehow destroy one of the Golan platforms. Yeah, that uh, it melts through star. everything. And it's like, obviously you have to wonder, okay, so the Golan, or sorry, the mirror has enough energy reflecting back to go through this Golan platform. Like it described as like piercing through the shield and then like going through each hull layer. How do they not use this on their ships? Like, why don't they have a big mirror strap to, why don't they bring a mirror ship into battle then? It's free energy. Free real estate. They, I mean, it's probably just, Something to do with shields not being focused on it is the right, retcon, don't. but I I don't think even without shields they should have <laughs> been able to do that. It's like Sid from Toy Story. Yeah, it's Sid melting a golem. <laughs> that would have been a very, very obscure reference if they'd included that in Toy Story. <laughs> Literally no one would get it. <laughs> um, yeah. But, Solar mirror warships. Uh, oh. So sounds like a job last, for Lando. Last part of that operation, uh, we should go into too much detail on would just be how Corin and the Tie Fighter collide with things because that kind of yeah, why they think Tycho little... is. I kind of think they should have just removed that part. Like I think I think they could have had a so basically there's they destroy the main or they disable the main generator but there's a backup generator it's like hidden completely under it's like under a, a statue right um a statue so, of palpatine yeah yeah so corin has got his z95 and i guess he's i think he's the only one that's able to do it because he's got to see he's got to fly into the storm for that doesn't he yeah he's got to fly into the storm and then he's only got two concussion missiles yeah, so he this thing is deep underground too. So he blows up the concrete and everything surrounding the. Uh, I guess it, it it's not even like a generator. It's described more as like a because he compares it to the, um, the conduit on is it Borlias that had the yeah, conduit. I, I think it's more like a, a kind of a repeater station. Yeah. So and it was keeping the shields up a bit. Like the yeah, they had the inner shields down by that point. I think the outer shields still weren't. And yeah, they're like shifting all power. power to the other yeah. shield. Yeah. So Corin flies into the storm. He was alone. No one else. This is when the line about 
uh, no one except for maybe Pash being able to keep up with Corrin. Mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, so he hits the statue with the first missile, and that provides enough of a shield for the conduit that it's not that he doesn't take it out. Mm-hmm. And even flying back around with the second missile wasn't going to be enough to do it. So uh, Winter remotely uses all of her access codes to get into the Tyner Scepter make it lock on to the missile and follow the missile, mm-hmm. which to get out of that, the Tyner Scepter pilot would have had to take in several seconds to do some override codes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the idea was that the missile would hit, blow, and then the Tyner Scepter would fly in right after. And so that's how they take that out. But then the same thing kind of happens to Corrin. Yeah. Well, it seems too like his ship just locks up. Yeah, his ship locks up and then... They tie it back to Tycho getting accused of uh, of killing Corrin because he's the one that procured, procured mm-hmm. the Z-95s. Z-95s. This is probably very upsetting. Triggering American. so many Americans. Yeah. <laughs> the Z-95s. Uh, Zed. The Zeds. Yeah. The Zeddy boys. Uh, and Zed's top. his locks up. He flies into the building and everyone thinks he died in the impact. But before mm. they'd gone on this mission, uh, Pash had overheard an argument between Tycho and Corin, where Corin was yeah. saying he was going to look into Tycho, find anything he's done to prove that he is a sleeper agent. And uh, then Tycho references how like he's glad that Corin has that Z95, that Zeddy boy, because that's the one that he was flying and he'd been uh, yeah, I forgot about that. taking care of it himself. So Pash is kind of looking over and heard part of it. It's like literally the worst case scenario for Tycho. Yeah. <laughs> Which he reluctantly had reported to his father, Aaron, uh, who a lot Very of public intelligence. Point. Yeah. But. Um, at that point, isn't this like the first clue too about the Lusanka's true nature? Because when his ship is going down, don't doesn't he see like he sees yeah. a yeah, he sees a super star destroyer. On um, his uh, on his targeting computer, I think it was. He's getting. Yeah. He's saying he's getting ghost readouts or ghost ship readings, where mm-hmm. he's got the tie interceptor reading. Then under that, sometimes it's a tie interceptor, sometimes it's a super star destroyer, which mm-hmm. clearly can't be right. But it's because Lusankia, the Boys, prison is we right. hear about, is a super star destroyer under the surface of Coruscant. Yeah, and when. Um... <laughs> And when I started says she's going to leave Coruscant and go to Lusankia, she means no, nah, she's going underground for a bit. <laughs> for a bit. Not forever. As we'll see soon. Yeah, so... Uh, I guess that handles all the... New Republic, New Republic side of stuff. We've yeah, Let's just briefly cover the Empire yeah. stuff because it's going to be a big thing moving yeah. forward too. Uh, it's something that came up a few times in the comments that we didn't talk about it with Rogue Squadron and it's something that we've kind of glossed over here. Not Sorry, I, I lost you there for a second. We didn't talk about who? Uh, it's something that it's come up in the comments a few times that last time and this time we didn't talk too much about it. But it's more just because they're already two hour long podcasts and it's something mm. that's really going to play into uh, Kratos Trap and Back to War a lot more. Uh, is so, that the Imperials? I lost you at the beginning there. Yeah. Like, what is it we didn't talk about? The Imperials? The okay. Imperials and the Kratos virus and that gotcha. plot. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's just for anyone wondering why we're glossing over it that much. Yeah. Uh, it just so we're, we're going to talk about it a li- little bit now, but it's more yeah. that just it's a lot more. It comes into play with what's going on next time. But uh, yeah, you want to go over what yep. Isard's plan is? <clears throat> so basically, Derricote, who's the Imperial they found at Borlias. He is right. It's yeah. the same dude, isn't? It? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's on. He's on Coruscant now, and he's bioengineering this disease that will only um, harm uh, non-humans, which I think would be probably extremely difficult because most likely humans and um, you know other humanoids probably have a common ancestor. But whatever. Um, so he's engineering this virus, and um, Coruscant is basically. Isara has decided, as we mentioned earlier, that she's going to give up Coruscant, but she's going to give it to the New Republic completely poisoned with this Krytos virus. It's actually in the water before they even secure the planet. Um, And basically, the Empire's only goal here, which kind of diminishes the efforts of the New Republic a little bit, is to hold the planet long enough for this disease to propagate. 
and it's a uh, it's quite a nasty disease too. It talks about it has kind of individual effects on different species. It kills them in I think about a week, but um, I think who was it? One species maybe twi'lek so or the uh, the Gamorians break out in boils that all kind of explode, and then yeah. the Corin uh, it liquefies right, exactly. their bones, so they turn and into they basically like, a puddle. And like leaks out of them. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's one really funny, well, it's not funny, but there's one quote about like Coruscant's, um, it's it's like the streets of Coruscant being filled with alien goo puddles, basically. Yeah. Let's see if I can find it. But it's, it's, it's pretty, it's actually pretty disgusting. So a lot of, uh, a lot of the Imperial subplot is Lauren Derricote or Derricote through lore reporting to Isard and the progress on the virus and mm. lore kind of checking up on what the progress is for the virus where Isard specifically wants it to not transmit to humans mm. and wants it to be curable by Bacta. The yeah, idea that being that uh, the New Republic would then have to spend all their resources on procuring Bacta. It's important that the New Republic knows they can do that because then they're going mm. to spend all their money on Bacta to treat the population of Coruscant. And because it's such a big planet with so many aliens on it, uh, it's all concentrated. And if they try to leave, they'd infect other planets uh, while keeping humans safe uh, mm -hmm. and just drain all the New Republic's resources. Then the Imperials could come back and take command once the population has either, if the New Republic doesn't cure everything, run out of resources or lost the support of the population for not yeah. treating them It first. basically makes them look like another empire, yeah. kind of. It puts like them... They're in a no-win situation. Right. Because the Empire themselves, like, they wouldn't have... They wouldn't have done shit about it, but, you know, they're the Empire. They don't have to. But, like, the New Republic is this new faction that's supposed to be alien-friendly. Um, it's kind of interesting because there is an element of, like... This book touches a lot on that kind of human... Like, humanocentric nature of, like, the Empire and how the New Republic will be... Uh, we we were joking about the uh, the stuff with Corin, but he actually does have like a pretty. So we can find it. He actually does have quotes talking about like whether humans and aliens should mate. And then uh, let's see. Oh yeah, throughout the galaxy, the permutations of relationships between two or more individuals were legion, as were formal and otherwise. Uh, blah 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 blah. He basically says it's a. Um, where is it? It's like a it's it's a look don't touch policy in Corsac. Um and he says, I guess I don't think it's wrong, but it just may not be right. That's what he says about yeah. interspecies relationship. And then we have the whole um alien not supremacy, but I guess alien rights group that comes up. Um and then we have Curtin Lore has kind of an interesting view of trying to find that quote yeah so he's got an interesting view about aliens too if you want to look for that the uh part of the plot of the book is that derricote is looking for new species to test it on so they've already covered a lot of the gamorians and corin testing by the start of the book uh mm -hmm. and he's trying to move on to celestians they were mm -hmm. they were debating a bit on what the next species would be that they go to uh where i think they start they bombs, come up, don't they uh the idea of Wookiees comes up first, and then they say oh, they're too yeah. good as slave labor. But yeah. then there's suggestions about like Bothans or Ewoks, I think was specifically used. Mm, yeah. But they're afraid that if they do that, it'd be too close to mutate to humans easily. Uh, right. And then they settle on Celestian. So Errol Nunn gets, uh, gets kidnapped in the middle of it. And she's part of, I think she's part of that group of Celestians that we see getting, uh, uh getting experimented on i don't know if it makes it i don't know if it says out right but it's not said out right but she that group of selections was captured during the raid mm -hmm. uh, so and it's probably... she was part of that group and it involved at least the kid that she was talking about so i'm not sure if she was the one that was let out or that was given the back to cure but mm -hmm. she was in that group because it's not explicitly clear what the relationship between everyone in there was. Right, because it, it does talk to her, or she does mention saving a Solaston, doesn't she? Yeah. Or, but she was actually, I think what happened, right, but then she, because what I imagined is later, she, it talks about her looking, sorry, my dog is being an idiot. Later it talks about her looking at like a Solaston kid and like waving and imagining that one she saved. Yeah. I kind of assumed that, um that those were the ones that were being let go. That mm -hmm. was a weird moment though, because, uh, to me, that almost felt like 
because Kurt and Lore is like pretty disgusted the entire time. And I do have a quote about that. But um, I almost felt like when I read that part about him asking for the the mother and the child to go, I almost felt like he was being like a bit of a softy there. Yeah. So uh, at some point when Derek Coates experimenting on them, uh, Lore is watching the effects of it. And there's the two like toddler age Celestians that are just vomiting mm-hmm. on the floor. And one of the uh, older ones who were led to believe are like, or at least Derek Coates and Lore believe are like mother and kid. Uh, yeah. they're like looking after the kids. So Lore says, well, give the cure to those two. And, uh, Derek Coates like, oh, mother and son, are you going soft or whatever? But yeah, Lore puts forward that it's no, we want them to be able to go and say what the cure is, but go ahead. Yeah, no, I, th- I think you're right. It just is interesting because Lore realizes that like the shit that they're doing on the planet, because this isn't just a disease that kill you, kills you. It's one that kills you in like a really, really terrible way. Mm-hmm. And like Isard especially is very calculated and brutal about it. Like at one point he says something like she's going to kill all this like Solistins, but leave enough to repopulate the planet at some point, which I thought was weird. Um, but then we have another point. Um, so this is when he's talking to um, Isard. He says, her reasoning seemed logical to him, which surprised Kurt and Lore. On one hand, she was in plotting away, or she was plotting away to slaughter millions of creatures in a most horrible way. Yet, on the other, she was concerned with having enough space of one species left alive to repopulate devastated worlds. Well, she, well, he had no love for Solistins and did see them as being inferior to humanity. He did think of them as something more than grain that could be poisoned and fed to rats, with some pristine kernels held back as seed stock. So. It, it it like oh and then there's more too um just gotta flip to the next page um was there a time i would have seen this as insanity that question lurked in his brain and he was surprised that he did not have a clear answer to it so i think even curtain realizes that like this shit's a little messed up um but yeah yeah there's a there was another few places where lore shows at least some sort of reticence about it yeah, he like where, throws up the first time he sees it. Yeah, the I can't remember what I was, but he he his attitude towards Derrico like he gets kind of hostile yes. because it puts him in jeopardy just from him from Derrico doing things incorrectly. Mm-hmm. But there's also some parts where he kind of just points out how horrible what they're doing is, and then tries to like walk it back as like, oh no, I actually mean like this kind of horrible. But it's like, no, you yeah, you don't seem to be fully on board here. And he he just he does get more like just hostile to Derrico generally, like when he sees what's going on, not even just like it clearly because they're kind of buddy buddy in book one. Yeah. I mean, especially especially Derrico to Curtin because he he, like gives him a gift and stuff. But yeah. Yeah, but I think does anything else to bring up now about the general Kratos virus stuff? Because we're definitely going to come up a lot next. Yeah, I mean, just I guess it doesn't. They they do have plans for it. I think Derricot overpromises a little bit because yeah. they can't get it airborne. Um, yeah, that was a it, big deal. And also yeah. the new republic, like because it's waterborne, and the plan was to evaporate all the water. Mm-hmm. That kind of ruins a little bit of the stock. But yeah, yeah, and then eventually it's like basically it, there needs fluid contact between species. Yeah, which Corin's all about. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess it's also worth pointing out that at least three members of Rogue Squadron were infected, but then got back right. to treatment. Like Errol was given uh, the virus by Lauren Derrico, yeah. but uh, Nawara and Shiel were sick and unable to fly in the last mission. That's how uh, kind of Seer and Iniri get into the squadron and are flying mm-hmm. in the in the mission because they're out of commission because they have the early stages of Kratos. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I mean, it's an interesting plan. And I get, well, well, but we are being kind of quiet because we will talk more about this a lot next episode, especially. Yeah. Um, so anything else you want to mention though? Uh, do you just want to close out with at least as far as that goes before we get to the book rankings and any questions yeah. people have with, uh, Lore's or with Isard's grand plan for uh oh yeah yeah so 
while she is leaving the world poisoned to the public, she also, and she is retreating herself, um, she says to Lusankia, does Curtin know what Lusankia is? Probably no, he not. He knows it's a prison. He doesn't know it's a Superstar Destroyer. As right. I don't, at least they never make that clear. If he doesn't. He, doesn't, he certainly doesn't know it's on world. Yeah, he um, knows Isard is going to leave, but I think he thinks Isard is going to leave in a Star Destroyer, not mm-hmm. a Super Star Destroyer. Right. And so, yeah, so Curtin is basically being left behind to... I don't know if he's got a specific goal other than like coordinating resistance, I guess, across the planet. Yeah, he's basically supposed to take the role that the New Republic had for the Black Sun. Yeah. Uh, where they're just going to try to... Just an absolute terrible choice, too. The, uh, what was it called? The, pal- the Counterinsurgency Palpatine uh, Front yeah. or something? Yeah, I can't remember, but yeah, it's something like that. Um, he's basically given carte blanche to... Do whatever, yeah. Just basically cause shit. To, yeah. Well, Isard leaves Coruscant. Yeah, kind of reminds me of like after, like Yuzhan after Coruscant's transformed to Yuzhan Tar. There's like just people left in the Undercity causing trouble. Palpatine counterinsurgency front, right? ECF. But yeah, yes. so uh, that's going to be his job. Mm-hmm. He was kind of looking forward. It comes up that he was kind of looking forward to. Uh, fighting with Corrin again, but now yeah. Corrin's dead, so poor Kurt. Well, he was also scared kind of silly of Corrin. Yeah. But um, but yeah, he sees it as kind of a... It's like his first chance, I guess, to kind of prove himself, and he basically talks to Isar, and he's like, if I do this, like, I, I want real power, basically. Like, I don't want to just be your errand boy anymore. She's like, well, you'll probably have earned it, we'll see. And he's yeah. basically like, yeah, she might have to kill me after this. He basically tells him, "You'll be power if you manage to succeed in this. You'll be powerful enough to tell me what you deserve, and yeah. we'll just see if I'm stupid enough to say no to you." Yeah. Uh, which basically means, if you survive this, you're there's first off no chance you're surviving this. Second mm-hmm. off, I'm probably gonna have to kill you, but will I succeed? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh, again. We'll talk more about this, but it's interesting. It. it... I mean that's that's the thing though. Of course, not such a big city. You can you can hide, you know, you can hide people anywhere. Like yeah, um, if you get a group of ten thousand people supporting you, that's nothing. <laughs> yeah, it kind of reminds me of in the Thrawn duology. Thrawn's got all those kind of like sleeper groups hidden across the New Republic. Yeah, um, suit like tears everywhere. <laughs> yeah, basically, <laughs> the whole farm of just suit tears. <laughs> Um, I'm just looking through my notes. I I see references, two quotes, and there's, there's just a couple pages apart. Lieutenant Darklater, I'm a Corellian. I have no use for odds, but we're Corellian, so what use do we have for odds? And that's just like a couple pages apart. It's really <laughs> nice. Um, but yeah, but you're a Corellian. You have no respect for how truly hopeless some tasks really are. Um, yeah. The, I guess the only other thing I wanted to mention is I really like how Corrin kind of misses Whistler. Like, yeah, there's a, a few points where he says, like, he kind of wishes Whistler was here. And then after the attack on the rebel base, he's like, is Whistler OK? I know he's just a droid, but like Whistler's fine. The only other note I had that we haven't talked about yet is that uh, the book does have a lot of focus on, like, how normal people would have viewed the Empire and the New Republic. And that's not something uh, we yes. get in too many places. So I did like when that was coming up and we got that examined a little bit. Yeah, especially when they're at the museum, I guess, is probably what you're thinking of mostly. Uh, when they're at the museum, and then when they're generally talking about how... Uh, I think Corn was talking about it with oh, the evacuation, yes. where right. they're seeing all those rich people leave, and it's like, uh, a lot of them probably bought into the Imperial propaganda. They right. thought... They're uh, going to rape and pillage and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, I do like that too. It's just like... The, the And there's a few sources that talk about this, basically just like the closer you are into the core, like the more you have the Imperial propaganda machine, like messing yeah. with you and like the rich are all leaving basically like with everything they have because they think the New Republic are just going to come down and like slaughter them all like big revolution. Yeah. And uh, when they were at the museum, they talked about it was something that came up in especially Trusa Bakura, the idea that people wouldn't hear about the fact that the Empire was dead for a long time. Mm. But the museum 
uh, references were all like, oh, this shows how the Empire died. But part of that does show that the Imperial narrative is admitting that Palpatine is dead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was interesting. Um, <laughs> I mean, it is it is kind of cheesy. Like the idea of Palpatine walking into this giant, I think they, they call it a, like a mining weapon or something. And Yeah, it was a, an Imperial or- fleet. <laughs> Imperial ore mining facility that the rebels, the evil rebels, were going to use to destroy inhabited worlds. Right. Of course they were. Um, but yeah, then in the same museum, there's like Ewoks and stuff everywhere. But um, but yeah, that was that was an interesting idea. I think another part. I think when they're flying into Coruscant, I I, I forgot to to note this down, but there's a part where. They say, I think it's Corin says there will be sections of the Empire that might not fall figure out about Palpatine's death for centuries, is what he says. Yeah, um, I thought that was interesting. It would have been cool to see a story like that, kind of like Lost Tribe of the Sith style, Lost Tribe of the Sheev, I guess. I mean, do you kind of get that with the Nogri? Kind of, yeah. They don't believe. Yeah, but uh, there's, I think there's somewhere else where. It- kind of happens but no one believes him i can't remember what yeah, it was. i'm trying to think um but uh oh dala dala kind yeah of. that was kind of but she was directly like she was entirely cut off that wasn't more yeah. that wasn't really a proximity thing so much as a well i, I think corin says it as a proximity thing yeah yeah it's always put forward in this as like a, or as whoever a proximity is, yeah. thing yeah but uh, I guess you want to do the rankings, and then if anyone has any questions, if you want to sure. start thinking of to get to, I the really don't know the rankings, record. man. I've been trying to figure out. I I, th- I really like this book just because I really, it's cool to see like you don't see Coruscant or civilian worlds like this really very much. So Rogue Squadron is great because it does such a good job of introducing the characters and. Uh, making the stakes feel real and this book kind of loses that especially where it feels like losing coruscant is kind of assumed um but you know what this i was reading this book for trusa Pakura and rogue squadron i read them before i started this podcast but for this book i was reading it this week and i've just had so much work to do and stuff but i actually really enjoyed the time i spent reading it like i would like just sit on the couch for like an hour or two every night and just like really enjoy the book and I think it's a worse book than Rogue Squadron, but I think right now it's higher for me. I'm, I think I'm going to put this at number one. So Truce of Bakura, uh, sorry, <laughs> Truce of Bakura is three, Rogue Squadron is two, and then this would be number one for our three book ranking so far. Yeah, I think I have to agree with a lot of that. Like I was reading, uh, I was reading the three like as we went for the podcast, but this was, I, I enjoyed Truce of Bakura and Rogue Squadron. I do think Rogue Squadron is probably objectively better. Yeah, I but. Agree. When I finished, uh, what is it? Wedges Gamble. Yeah. <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> uh, when I finished Wedges Gamble, if you want to go to the chat there for a second, uh, when I finished Wedges Gamble, I yeah. immediately wanted to just continue with, uh, with Kratos Virus. I started reading the first few chapters of Kratos Virus. So there was a lot of more interesting stuff like the, I did like the focus on how people viewed the political structures Mm -hmm. and that we saw a bunch of stuff that we wouldn't see in other places. So even though I do think Rogue Squadron was technically better, like if I was reading them all Mm -hmm. on their own, it might be in the future more Rogue Squadron that I'd go towards. I probably will put what is a gamble above it just because of it's got a really fun like feel to it. It does. You you do lose out because there are space battles like. There's yeah. the bit with with court at the end, but that's about it. And that's one of the strong suits. And I guess the I guess the bit at the beginning too with the uh, the bulk cruise or whatever. But I don't know. This book is just such a fun read, and it's like it's it's very compelling because it's fun watching these characters. And you are starting at this point to like I remember when I was reading through X Wing again, not recently, but the time before, like the characters of Iella and like. I guess it would be, it would have been a Reese and a yellow because they had similar names, which kind of occupied a like a similar space in my head as like, and then Mirax is like love interest for, uh, for Corrin. Mm-hmm. 
And but this book, all the characters feel like they kind of branch out a bit more. They all kind of have their own personality. I think it does a good job of building off of the first book. It feels very kind of like a continuation. Like sometimes when you read multiple books in a series, especially I think where there's a gap between release, um, it, there's a lack of like not not lore continuity, but like continuity of character and continuity of um, you know, but. Yeah, I don't know. There's just this book is just really enjoyable, and I really. There are some issues with it. It's it's not like. It's not, super complicated or like, like philosophical or anything. But I thought it was really enjoyable. So for me, it's got to be number one. Yeah, I I think it's easier to point out, uh, some of the flaws with it than with Rogue Squadron. But I, I do think overall it ends up coming on top for me as well. I'm curious because it's been a while since I've read Krytos Trap, and I don't, I don't really remember, I don't really remember a whole much about like how, like how much I enjoyed the book last time. So I'm curious whether that will take, like where that's gonna fall. Do you have any predictions for yourself? Uh, I think I'm probably gonna put it below Wedge's Gamble, mm-hmm. but above Rogue Squadron. It all, I. The thing that makes me say that is just that it starts to pay off uh, the traitor plot a bit more, which is kind mm-hmm. of the where the intrigue comes from with this. With that, I think made me put it higher than Rogue Squad. I think that uh, that subplot probably raises it for me. Mm-hmm. So with that just being resolved, or not res- at least the Tycho parts of it, the trial isn't that one. So mm-hmm. I think finishing it may not be as good for me as the lead up to it was. But mm-hmm. it could be that I actually enjoy that part a lot more and then put it on top. So that's what I'm going to be looking for. Yeah. All right. I I, I think I agree. Um, I'll, I'm curious, though. Looking forward to it, at least. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that'll be uh, that'll be July 10th on Datapad. Uh, yeah. So that'll be our next episode. So now if anyone in the chat has any questions you want us to get to, Right now, if there's any that you think of between the episodes and you want us to address them, we do have the tapcalf transmissions at gmail.com email address. You can send them into and we'll open the next show with it. I'm going to check that right now, too, to make sure we didn't get any while the thing was going. So I know we got one today. Um... Corey, what's our password? Uh, it's password. Oh, I'm that in. is one other thing that I did want to bring up from my notes. The whole. Uh, the M tree thing. Oh uh, yeah, like the fact that shut up, shut up, shut up is how you get into it. That seems like the most common thing someone would say to a droid <laughs> say like to that. A droid, yeah. So it's basically like having your password be password. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Except like you might accidentally say it like they. I'm just reading the emails. I think. I think we got all the comments. Um. You guys have been leaving comments on Podbean, which is. I read all of those. I read all of them before I does on YouTube. Um, and of course, the email, I think. We got some nice ones from... Let me just see. But yeah, is there any is there any chat questions that we've got to read? I'm trying to remove this guy from spamming, but it's I just blocked him and it's not letting me remove him. So just block that guy. Stupid YouTube. We should probably make each other mods. That would. Yeah, I don't know why it's not letting me. It's not giving me the mute option. But just ignore that guy. He's a loser. <laughs> well. Anyways, uh, so uh, one question I'm seeing right there. Uh, we might move. Uh, overselling Jeremy is saying ranking might not work in a very short period of time with Sony books. Might be better go with the tier system. We'll probably evolve how we're handling, but right now, at least in the first few, we'll probably group them together different ways. But it'll just be whatever works at the moment. Like with the rankings, it's just it's entirely subjective. So you guys might come to entirely different conclusions to us. It's basically just to give an idea of how we're feeling about each one. So if we need to alter the format for that, we'll probably just mm-hmm. go with the flow on it. Yeah. Um, and again, we we are trying to because I know I saw. Some- platforms we are trying uh i think stitcher is one that we've got some questions about so we will try to be on stitcher um 
But for now, we actually are on iTunes, which is good. There's a bit of a wait. iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and of course, YouTube. But any other questions about... Oh, Joel Davis asks, how fleshed out was the Imperial situation in terms of Izard control and the Warlords compared to the Thrawn trilogy? And did the museum make Vader look less evil-looking? For the latter, it made everyone in the Empire look less evil-looking. certainly made Vader look more um, dedicated to Palpatine. Um, so what do you think about the fleshing out of the Imperial situation? Besides for Zin, there's not really much of that in this book. Yeah, a lot of the fleshing out of what the broader Imperial situation is comes with source books. Because with mm. each individual book, you had this like warlord of the day and there was not a huge indicator of how they all fit together uh yeah. like dark saber mentioned a bunch of them but mm. then they all got like retroactively put in their place with the uh with like essential guide to warfare and that kind of thing and that article too to spoilers of, empire, of an empire yeah yeah, yeah. um Corey asks, is there a book that covers imperial bioweapons not one book but i think there's a section on that in the um one of the guides to technology Uh, let's keep the questions to the book you um, like the way we'll, we'll Florivora was done in this book or the next two I think we'll probably talk about if you want to bring that back up yeah because uh, in, in this book we don't really yeah he's good in this book Um, yeah I, I gotta reread I, I kind of vaguely remember with him but yeah anything else for this specific book we kind of talked in the first episode about other people adding to Legends where they have uh, Marvel Star Wars 108 that came out. Fantasy yeah. game stuff still applies to both. The older public expansions kind of apply to both. Um, yeah. So there are some avenues for that. And the more people support older Legends content, the more it's likely, or new releases for Legends-related content, the more likely it is that uh, mm -hmm. it'd be getting additional stuff. So basically what I'm saying is that uh, by doing shows like this and encouraging people to go out and buy legends book eckhart and i are uh heroes we're we're keeping legends afloat so yeah good. you're welcome you're guys welcome. yeah we get nothing from this at all like the super chats you got <laughs> oh yeah also i probably let's i will take a second to thank donations i don't i won't do it live because um we're doing this will be on podcast i don't want to just do but uh, thank you, Jonathan, for the very generous $55 donation. Um, James, Jonathan again, uh, Mitchell, and FedDoc. Thank you, everyone, for the donation. And just thanks for tuning in as well. Um, oh, Evan does have a good point, too. We, when we talked about Sith Lords, there was the Tales thing in 90, which was a pretty brave comic. Have you ever read that, Tales of the Jedi? Not recently. I did when I was like earlier on starting Throne Revenge, but... Mm -hmm like 13 years ago now so yeah all right well i think i'm done Corey. anything else you'd like to uh do you want to plug anything uh no i'm good uh, i guess just Any cool videos coming up uh this weekend i think i'm gonna have one on the chiss ascendancy anything Ooh. you've got uh not really i will i'm gonna be away actually on friday morning i'm going to be gone until tuesday i think so like i'm going to toronto i'll be there for canada Day and stuff um, so no streams or anything. I do have some videos planned. Other than that, I'm really looking forward to not next week's stream. And we will be back to Thursday with the week after that. Yeah. So our, our next uh, next episode is going to be the Kratos virus. Uh, that will be on my channel, Corey's Datapad, which is linked below, I guess, my icon for you guys on this channel here. I have a beautiful, awful face cam in my version of the video. But uh, that'll be July 10th. And then for anyone who wants to watch it on Justin's channel, uh, that'll be the VOD for that will be put up right after. Just like every episode is going to be put on both channels. Mm -hmm. But if you have any questions for that, if you have any more suggestions for the show, leave them in the comments or uh, email us at tapcaftransmissions at gmail.com. Yeah, we really like getting your emails too, by the way. Like if you want to reach us, like Corey and I get lots of messages and stuff. But if you definitely want to reach us, the email is the best way. And if you have what I encourage too, because it'd be nice to have this as a sort of book club format. If you see something you like or you want to talk about um, while you're reading it, just put an email, jot it down, add your thoughts, and we will um, we'll get to them. Yep. All uh, right. That's all so, I yep, me too. 
Thanks for watching, guys. As always, this has been Justin with Corey. Until next time, may the force be with you. Everyone, thanks for watching. All right, we're done.